How's everyone doing? Is everyone good? Sweet. <laughs> all right, let's get started. Um, all right, is everyone good online? All right. I'll assume that's a yes. All right, so um, since I forgot to introduce myself again, I'm Tasha Snow. I'm a research associate at the Colorado School of Mines. So I'm gonna chat now with you about what CryoCloud is. It's not even on. Um, so I talked to you, uh, we talked a little bit yesterday, what, what is open science? Um, NASA has said that science done in a more fundamentally open way, way is the way of the future. And um, that description, that definition is something that you saw yesterday. You also heard about the Open Source Science Initiative and the Transform to Open Science program that NASA is pushing to make um, science more transparent, inclusive, accessible, and reproducible. And so we uh, at CrowdCloud kind of came out um, from this uh, funding call and um, are pushing a lot of this forward using cloud computing. And so that's all going to be, um, we're, we're bringing a lot of people in the cloud cloud as part of this year of open science. And so, as I mentioned yesterday, the cloud is this collaborative reproducible um, open science place to do all of these, uh, these things. Uh, I mentioned what the cloud is. This is all in the internet where your data and your servers are. Um, and, it's really, the cloud is creating this digital watering hole where our data is this um, substance that everyone needs to use, depend, no matter what sort of field you're in, everyone needs to access the data, but it can no longer be um, held on your computer. So, um, so we're using the cloud to keep the data up um, accessible to everybody. We can put our servers and our tools in the same location and um, build those tools in a way that we need them to be built. And it allows us to access the big data, disparate data, um, allow participation of diverse communities and to ultimately connect with society and impact critical decision-making on timescales that can be much faster than they used to be because we can access the data really quickly. So um, let's talk about the concepts and skills um, for using this tool as um, a way of creating thought and making reproducible and open science. So some of the practical skills that um, we can, that are useful for open science, um, we have version control in CryoCloud. We can use Git and GitHub programming. We can use something like Python that's open, uh, process automation. We can do data analysis, software testing, documentation and publishing, continuous integration and reproducible containers. Um, so the Jupyter book is one way that um, places, groups like uh, AGU are starting to really test for using um, as a means for publishing. So you can create um, a lot of text. You can put all of your figures and everything in testable code into a Jupyter notebook, someone can run it, and that makes it completely reproducible and transparent. So anyone can get onto the internet and access it. Um, so this is this is one of the new ways of the future for, for publishing. And what you can add to one of those repositories where you have that Jupyter book is um, a my, my binder button. So you can see that right here at the bottom. Um, this is basically where you create an environment in the cloud People can push that button, they open up your code, and they can immediately use it. They don't have to install anything. It makes it completely um, interactive and, and reproducible. And so some of this has been tested in the STAT 159 course run by Fernando Perez, who is a faculty member at Berkeley and co-founder of Jupyter and also one of the collaborators on this project. Um, he runs this course every year where during the course of a semester, he teaches everyone in the cloud 
they are by the end of the semester they've created a jupiter book based on whatever project they wanted scientific work they wanted to do there's a main paper as part of it there's supporting analysis um, notebooks there's code and tests for all of it and then there's the binder um, link so that it's all reproducible and so these are examples of some of the studies that have been done um, in that data science course so exploring air quality and also uh, studying breast cancer. And what's really cool about the cloud and using this as an educational tool is that you can actually teach 50 to 2,000 students in the cloud for one to $2 per semester per student, which is crazy. They're, so it's super, it's super um, cost effective as long as the infrastructure is built in a way that um, reduces costs, which is what the CryoCloud is. We've done this with Jupyter Hub um, that's been built for you guys. If you were to do this on your own without all the background information, it would be very challenging to create numbers like this because we actually built CryoCloud um, for partially this, this reason where people were racking up dollar, like a lot of costs without realizing it, which I'll talk about in just a second. So we have these new spaces and we need organizational models um, for working in the cloud. So as I was just mentioning what CryoCloud kind of came out of, um, the ISAT 2 science team meeting is a meeting where um, the science team that kind of runs the mission for ISAT 2, ISAT 2 is um, a laser altimeter that is um, owned by NASA and yeah, the science team runs that mission. They meet twice a year. In May last year, myself and Joanna Milstein, who is the other lead on this project, um, were sitting in on an open science cloud panel where people talked about the issues that they had with the cloud. And some of those issues are shown here. They said that there was non-intuitive pricing structures, computing options and infrastructure documentation was poor. It was costly to use took time to transition their workflows. There were worries around intellectual theft and it wasn't obviously more collaborative or faster. And that may be some of the worries that you guys have, um, but our mine and Joanna's uh, experience in the cloud was very different than this. And part of the reason why is because we worked with 2I2C. So 2I2C is the Inter International Interactive Computing Collaboration. They're a nonprofit who provide interactive computing um, environments for, um, for whoever purchases it. So they're a service provider of it. And they build these, their mission is for um, making these as cheap and um, useful as possible for education and research. And this was born out of three different institutions, um, Pangeo, UBC, uh, University of British Columbia and Berkeley all creating these kinds of Jupiter hubs and then being catastrophically successful. They built these, everyone wanted them, but as institutions, they're not able to provide them. So they founded um, 2I2C instead. And so 2I2C provides these services now for everybody. And so working with 2I2C, um, they their goal is to contribute back to the open source community. A lot of them are uh, people who have built some of the Jupyter infrastructure that everybody uses. Um, they also have these, um, these goals of having, uh, having no vendor lock-in and community empowerment. So they um, stand by the right to replicate. All of their infrastructure can be taken to any other um, vendors or you can take it yourself and, and rebuild it yourself. All of the code that you have is, is in the background and you, you can use it yourself. And they have a shared responsibility model where um, they will allow you to participate as much as you want at first, and they will teach you along the way so that you can help to develop skills working in the cloud to stand up and maintain your own infrastructure um, after some time, some parts of the infrastructure and only in the places that you're really interested. So it's a really cool organization to work with. And I've been learning a ton working with them. Um, so knowing how 2I2C functions, after going to that ISET2 science team meeting, we decided to build CrowdCloud, uh, which is a cloud computing platform with bumpers. 
So it was meant to be a simple and cost-effective cloud-managed environment, as I mentioned yesterday, um, for training and transitioning new users to cloud workflows, and we want to uh, create uh, community best practices. And so it's built for CrowdSphere scientists by cloud engineers to be able to process data faster, democratize science, work more collaboratively. As I mentioned yesterday, it's gonna be persistent for at least three years, hopefully longer if we show it successful. Um, as you'll see in a few moments, you um, everyone has access to small servers, which are um, shared. You can get anything um, from one to 32 gigabytes that are yours alone. And um, the servers are actually 32 gigabytes. So they're, um, I'll, I'll show you in a moment what that means. Um, but basically all users have access to that. And then you can have larger servers built for you if um, you bring your own cloud credits. We are creating new tools within this project. One of them is a cost monitoring tool. So you can understand your usage and how much you're charging up while you're using the cloud. That's currently not available on Jupyter, but eventually it will be a button on the Jupyter Hub um, that is, and this will be something that goes into Jupyter Hub for everybody, not just um, our community. And we're also trying to create improved intra and inter hub tools if you're using multiple hubs. Um, how do those hubs communicate better? All these tools are being developed under this project. And along, uh, along with that, we are working with 2I2C to help them scale up because they're a new nonprofit by providing community surveys, feedback, and guidance. And so what we end up getting is a hub that has custom environments, online content, cloud infrastructure, and the support and services we need. And all it takes to authenticate and access it is for us to have your um, GitHub user ID. We add it into our GitHub um, organization. As you've seen, you, you get invited um, to our organization and then you immediately have access. So all it requires is your GitHub user ID and password to get into um, CryoCloud. And so this creates a unified experience for research computing that looks very similar between your laptop, your cloud computing environment, your HPC environment, all of these should look very similar. Um, so this is the cloud hosted installation, and this is what it'll look like when we open it up. This is the, the Jupyter Hub. It looks just like Jupyter Lab, and it includes Jupyter Notebooks. So whichever of those you're familiar with, um, you should be able to recognize that. How many people have used Jupyter Notebooks or Jupyter Lab before? Most people? Cool. Awesome. We also have our studio and MATLAB um, if you want to use those. So, um, so those are going to be accessible. And um, it's it has Jupyter Lab has all, everyone's going to be able to access Jupyter Lab basically when they open up the um, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, they might have asked if it's the same because I've never used Jupyter Lab or anything like that. Uh -huh. So, what's the difference between Jupyter Lab or notebook? I mean, I don't want you to take too much. Time. Oh, yeah. No, I can explain it very quickly. So, Jupyter Notebooks is the oldest version. Um, it's basically just this, uh, like, one notebook with code that has a bunch of different cells in it. It works very similar to, like, if you have an R Studio script. It's basically your script is the notebook. Lab provides these other kinds of um, tools that include like fi file folders um, that you can see. It allows you to open Markdown, uh, open multiple books, uh, notebooks at the same time. You can view them side by side. And this is on your local computer. And then Jupyter Hub is in the cloud. So it's pretty much the same thing. But um, now you have shared folders with other groups for other people that are on your hub. Um, there's cloud access, that sort of thing. So within Jupyter Lab, we also we have the full terminal window that we can have. We have file management. You have markdown. You can do preview um, here, or you can do editing. Um, oops, wrong direction. We have a launcher that'll have all the tools. You see this, you'll see this in just a moment. 
There's viewers for CSV. You can edit the view the CSV separately. There's different kinds of um, image uh, geojson JSON uh, visualizations that you can use that are automatic. And you can do normal computing in them as well. There's a virtual desktop. It's a Linux desktop. And in that, we have uh, Qt Greenland, which um, you can open up through QGIS. And we have file synchronization um, tools called SyncThing, which is very similar to Dropbox. It'll allow you to sync between your local computer, um, the, the cloud, and um, like you can share with other people as well, just like you would be able to with Dropbox. And as I mentioned earlier, we have the option for having multi different images. So this right now is just our MATLAB and Python. All of them just open up in a Jupyter hub, um, but then you can push a button and get to those specific um, programs. And eventually that may mean we also have different environments. So we can have like a machine learning environment because that's going to be very big and not many people need to use it and have our separate like image processing uh, environment that we kind of have going right now or cryosphere like general image. Um, so there is some versatility in that. Right now we just have one image for Python. Um, node sharing looks a little bit like this. Um, as you'll notice in a, a few minutes, basically a small server means you're opening up a server that has 32 gigabytes of, of met local memory and four CPUs. But in order to make this more cost effective, we can share with other people who are in our cloud and use less of the, um, the memory just on our own. And so what these numbers are, are a guaranteed number. So you get one gigabyte of memory up to 32, depending on who you're sharing with or if you are sharing with somebody. If you choose eight, then you get minimum eight, maximum 32. So that's what that, those numbers mean when you open those up. And having multiple CPUs allows you to do parallelized work eventually, um, that sort of thing. So you get, the, you get those kinds of um, added benefits. Yeah. Is there any plans for GPU resources? Uh, there can be. Yeah. So GPU resources are pretty expensive. So um, we can talk about, uh, we're, we have a certain number of cloud credits at the moment, and we are interested to know what how much people end up needing um, eventually, and we can apply for more cloud credits. People can also bring their own. So the GPUs will require more. Um, this is with AWS. This is with AWS, yeah. Um, and so what ends up coming out of this is you get something like this. This is a notebook that we ran um, with Landsat data. It's got ISAT2, Landsat, and Modus data that you open up into it all in one place. And it's coming straight out of the cloud streaming. And we're also using tools like X-Array, IcePix is the ISAT2 um, tool, Earth Access is the NASA tool, all of those things in one notebook. And not only that, we are pushing, like these are all being developed right now. We are kind of pushing those to their limits, testing those. The developers of the of those packages are also working in our in our cloud or similar clouds. And what that allows us to do is having all these different kinds of users. It accelerates feedback and collaboration and allows these tools to be developed for our exact needs. So when you have problems that come up, you can let people know, and then those tools get fixed. And if you need something that isn't being provided by that tool, we can those things can get added to these um, ice picks or earth access to make sure that you guys are able to do the things that you need to do, like when you have issues. And what that means is like we're actively participating in making sure that these tools are developed for our needs and we can do the things that we need to. So let's take CrowdCloud for a test drive. Um, I'm going to exit out of this. Yeah. It's an environment.yaml. We, um, we would want to create a separate image for you. 
Um, and that would just be added to our image selector. But so that has to be done like through the control. Yeah. I mean, you can, it's, you can, you can add your own image and we can then, you can just tell us and we can deploy it or I can help you, you do it depending on um, it, if you've done it before. My other question is if we wanted to use this for teaching, right? So now we want 30 students who each have their own account and then work on it. Is, is this not the right use case or because actually something that a few of us have talked about before is um, just having more like set resources for teaching let's say off of the Jupyter notebook and then being able to collaborate and like the free like binder, for example, is not really optimized for that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, do you see that as being a use case for this? So I think that is something we haven't, that that's a bridge we haven't crossed yet. Um, this is meant mostly to be for trading and, and everyday research at the moment. Um, but I, can see us potentially doing that. Um, we just haven't, like, we haven't decided to do that. I haven't gotten permission from 2I2C to do that um, as our collaborators. Most people don't have to ask that question. Um, but uh, yeah, with, with our team, we would discuss if we're ready to do that. That might be, that might be something we can't do in the first year, just because we're doing a lot of onboard, onboarding for our researchers. But um, we are allowing groups like Hack Weeks to come on. Um, we're doing the Q Greenland workshop. We're um, doing SnowX, ISAT2 Hack Weeks, um, and then supporting FOGS, WASTE, and AGU. And so this is an ideal place to be able to do that sort of thing. If you can bring your own cloud credits to kind of supplement what we have already, like the infrastructure takes a certain amount of money to keep going, and then the cloud credits are on top of that. And so we save you guys a bunch of money doing that. And it's a good way to test like what you end up needing, what our community ends up needing. So I can foresee us doing that. Um, we would just have to have a conversation when the time comes a bit ahead of time. Yeah. Um, I'm just gonna say on the chat thing, can you repeat whatever asking the question you're speaking? Oh yeah. <laughs> Alex asked if, um, if it can be, if the crowd cloud can be used for teaching a course. And I said, potentially with conversation. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I guess it's not directly sort of a similar vein question. So I'll ask it now. Is what, what is the, what is the thinking about, I, so I, I sort of see this as we, we have all these investigators that don't do research in the cloud and they're going to have to make their way. So let's educate them in getting this going. But what happens when the, the each of those people gets facile in this environment and wants to start scaling out? Have you thought about the offboarding problem, the sort of the onboarding problem where the, the NASA needs to articulate the trajectory here? I don't know, maybe, you know, I need to remove that hundred of cores and I need to remove a terabyte, you know, a terabyte of data in the cloud because I've learned how to do this here, but I can't scale. You should, you should be able to scale here. Well, it's, but does that mean that, that what I need to do is ask NASA for credits and bring it to you and my research is always in your environment? Or because there's, you know, you can't learn how to use the cloud to do quickly scale instantly on the weekend when you're thinking about it. Say you could come back and you are, if you become the free computer support for all of NASA's researchers. Oh know. yeah, it won't be for all of NASA's researchers. So, so that, no, but I mean, that's, there, you need to step out into the cloud and run big jobs. Yeah. And, and so I, I guess I just would encourage that conversation at the same time that you're thinking about how to, to scale the learning side of it is what is the trajectory out to do the research afterward? Because NASA's still figuring that out, right? They have they, Yeah, absolutely. As far as I can tell, I have no idea how to get funded to do $500,000 worth of cloud. Yeah. So, so Mark's question was, um, how how are we thinking about offboarding if people need to scale and do, say, large amounts of compute um, off of CryoCloud? Um, so my answer is, I'm not sure that you need to off to to get off of um, CryoCloud because, I mean, we can scale GPUs as large as is possible with AWS, and we can provide those to 
only the users who need them. Um, and you can bring your own cloud credits, right? If the, it's a function of like just being able to figure out how we get the cloud credits, whether I submit a proposal to AWS and we get $100,000 of cloud, cloud credits that way, or if we ask NASA for it, that's um, that we have to figure out. Um, but we can get large servers as people, if people really want to, to do that. Um, it's it's going to be much larger than the eleven thousand dollars of crowd, crowd credits that I have per year right now. Yeah. Um, but ideally, we can scale, and if we can't, then all the infrastructure is portable. Ideally, though, I mean, it costs a certain amount to keep this going. So if we provide this as a service, where this baseline cloud environment, Jupiter Hub, is stood up by like the Jupiter like developers. So this is like state of the art. Even the people who are going to run it from a different professional organization are not going to have the expertise that the people standing at this hub have because we have like the co-founder working on it. So ideally we can do this here, but if we yeah. can't, that's something we need to learn. Well, it's, and, and it, it, my question is probably actually really shallow. Um, this is a bit of that, but the, it, it, it's really the cloud credits, right? The answer is the cloud credits, because if, if you actually have the cloud credits, you can go and do the stuff in the cloud outside of this environment. You can bring your own container, yeah. and run your own jobs and scale it, but you need to pull in the process. So, I mean, it, it isn't necessary. I'm just saying it's not necessary to keep the research in this environment. Correct. That's, that's yeah, people can move out of it. Um... There's lots of different ways of doing it. Um, the infrastructure working with AWS um, is really hard. Uh, it's not intuitive. They make it very hard. They make it very easy to spend lots of money without meaning to. So yeah. Yeah, and Caitlin. I just want to add a little bit of context and correct me if I'm wrong, Tasha. So Trial, Trial Cloud was not meant to be this platform where you can do your science forever. It was born out of people's concerns about how to start using cloud computing in your science. So it was meant to just be this, this springboard for you to then take the skills that you learn while you're using this tool to then go and write your own proposals, get your own funding to get your own credits, server access to do your own science. So that, does, does that help with it? I do understand that they should be maybe helping people kind of offboard onto larger projects. But I don't think that this was meant to be scaled up in, per in perpetuity to allow people to continue doing massive projects with this system. We made it flexible so you can. Um, but I mean, it, you're correct. Uh, the, the, base, the base use that we have, the servers that we're providing only allow you to do your, your normal research on them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've... Uh, we've allowed the the ability to be flexible on that and part of it is learning what our community needs and how uh how we work with people within a community within an umbrella underneath nasa like we're each a village each each field that might be using the cloud computing we we each sit, sit under these umbrellas how do they communicate with each other um all of that requires us working and like figuring out like where we're pushing the boundaries. Um, so yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so if you go to hub.cryonthecloud.com, um, is everyone there and able to see this? Have you, you can click on cryonthecloud.com, you push a button that says, uh, I forget what the button is. Login, Login maybe. Uh, it, it says open the hub or it's a red button right underneath the cloud. Uh, CryOnTheCloud.com. If you're one of those people who didn't spill out the survey ahead of time, can you still gain it? Oh, yeah. Wilson, do you have that? I just see one. So if you submitted late, um, you'll receive a, an invitation to get our GitHub organization. You have to accept that and then you'll be able to access the cloud. So the uh, original page will be 
a, a crowd called logo with the red button underneath it. And that's the red button you need to click to get to here. And then it'll ask for your GitHub user name and um, password. All right, is there anyone else who needs any help? Yeah. All right, how many people are not quite on here? Okay. Hub.bio and the cloud.com. So you have you logged in? So say instead of go to that website, you can log me in. So you probably logged in earlier? Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk about that a little bit more, but you're already set. All right, I'm gonna keep going. We'll have a few minutes after this for us to work on this um, for each of you that's not quite on it yet. Um, we'll have plenty of time. Uh, so for everyone else, for everyone, you can just watch here. So you can choose which image that you want here. Python or MATLAB. If you choose the MATLAB kernel, just know you're going to have to bring your own um, license from your, your institution. So um, this is how we make this open source kind of without leaving people behind is that um, we provide the infrastructure for accessing MATLAB. Everyone who uses MATLAB, like the ISSM modelers, that sort of thing can, can access it in the cloud, um, but uh, we don't provide the license itself. And then R is um, available as well. We'll go with Python. We'll just do one gigabyte um, CPU. So, um, you mentioned ISSM, is ISSM built in the image? Um, no, there's some sort of, there's something, I think Dennis added it. There's something from ISSM that's in our public, our shared folder. I saw that, yeah. Um, but the rest isn't built. I'm not sure what's been done on that okay. front. That's what you guys are doing. Maybe the ISSM might do it. Yeah. We're here to like help people bring whatever they need into it. Oops. All right, so once that bar finishes, you should have something that looks just like this. All right, so this is a terminal window. This works just like um, your terminal on your computer. This is your command line. Um, home slash Jovian is like our home folders that you actually don't see here. So that's important to know when you're thinking about paths to your files. Um, home slash Jov Jovian, which is like, Jovian is the word right here. That That's gonna come between before all of your folders. 
If something doesn't isn't accessible, that's because you're missing that in your path. Um, when you look at the uh, Jupyter Hub, you have your your um, all of your files there on the on the left there, and um, these are your personalized ones. So these are this is where you can add anything that you like. No one else can see it. Um, that is added pretty much anywhere here. So I have like this folder here. This is um, my grad students working on that folder. There's a shared folder. Um, you should see that. And that has any data that has been shared with the community that's kind of protected by admin. And then shared public is one where all of us can share data freely, but everyone can also delete data freely. So the mm -hmm. shared public one is a place where you need to be very careful about what you delete or add or you can add things if you want to share them with the with our community, but please be very careful about only deleting your own stuff out of shared public. Um, everyone's got read write access to that. Oh yeah. And I'll make this bigger. Yeah, sorry. We're gonna do those. Yes. Oops. Yeah, question? Um, can you remind me what the shared folder space you used for? Shared? Yeah. So this one, this is data that's shared and protected by admins. So admins can write to it um, and it can be shared with the community. So we have some like events that like Q Greenland's gonna have some stuff in there. Um, and so these are files that everyone can access, but y'all don't have the ability to read or write or to write to this. Um, so this is kind of how you navigate um, through those file folders. Um, this is coming from this like folder button here. The next button down tells you the open tab. So I have a terminal window open. Kernel, your kernels are basically what runs your Python or your R. Um, code in the background. So each of the one, you'll have one of these for each of your notebooks or whatever that are open. And then there's one terminal that's open. The dash, uh, the dashboard for Dask is, Dask is a way of parallelizing your code. It's distributed um, coding, uh, computing. We don't have it entirely um, worked out yet because we don't have any users that are doing that. You can use Dask for one computer for like one of your servers, but you will eventually be able to create um, create tasks that use uh, multiple computers and you can monitor the progress here. But the next one below, um, I usually use the command line for opening up and dealing with all of my GitHub stuff, but you can do it in a kind of a GUI here. And just below here, this is um, basically an outline of your notebook. We're not showing a notebook now, but in a moment when we open up the next notebook um, for the tutorial Wilson will do, you'll see that this fills out and you can, you can skip to different parts of that notebook from here. Um, the button over here is um, for advanced, uh, you can you can change the metadata for a notebook there. I've never used that. This I think is going to be our usage um, for the Jupyter Hub. This button that we're creating that will monitor our usage and our costs that hasn't been fully constructed yet. And then this is for debugging, which is a new um, feature in Jupyter. Now, using all of this, you can go into settings and change your themes and your color um, your color schemes and stuff in here in the settings. Um, we're gonna go back to our main area here. When, so I have a terminal window open. I'm gonna close this here over on the side. I have a terminal window open, the plus sign launches a launcher. So that's where all of our buttons are. Um, Console is a place where we open up and can do like scratch kind of work. This opens up a Python notebook, a new one, and you can uh, start typing your code in there. 
if we do another launcher button here, um, the virtual desktop is basically your Linux desktop. And when it opens up, it looks like just like your computer would. Um, QGIS is here. So we open that up. We can open QGreenland from in there. We have our home file system. And what you'll notice is that the um, things that are in here are the same as the file structure that we see in our Jupyter lab over here. So all of these files um, show up just like they would in our computer in here. And there's things like you can search the internet and things like this. This means that you can do kind of seamless work between the um, the cloud, co the computing that you're doing and visualization and any things that any other things that you need. If there's tools that you need that are not on here, we can chat about um, adding those. And then sync thing, as I mentioned before, is like Dropbox. Um, the only thing that's that you the main thing that you have to do with sync thing is you need to choose who you're sharing with, whether it's your local computer or some other person. And so you have to add remote devices to do that. And all of the documentation to um, set all of that up is here. Um, we can open that up and here's the same thing documentation for uh, adding the passwords that you need, adding the remote um, devices, that sort of thing. So all of this is available. Um, there is infrastructure to be able to visualize things like geojsons um, without the actual background um, code that you normally like would look at. So like if I say open with editor, then it'll show this is what your geojson file actually looks like. And we can please. There we go. We can put these side by side. So this is the code. Um, and then we have a GeoJSON visualizer. This is showing the tiles from that GeoJSON file. We can visualize our CSV and um, we can edit it as well if we do it an open with editor. Um, so we can put those side by side if you want to like edit your CSV. You can also visualize it here on the left. Um, you can visualize images really easily. We've got three different windows next to each other. It's getting a little cluttered. Um, but there's lots of versatility in here. And um, yeah, so this is kind of, it, does anyone have any questions? This is, oh, I know what I need to um, leave you with. So. The kernel is the place where you can shut down your kernel, restart it. If you have a kernel that turns off while you're running something, it's probably because you run out of memory and you can just bump up your server um, to be able to um, not have that memory crash. Um, when you do installations, percent pip install within your notebook is how you do those installations. Um, your pip installations are not persistent from one use to the next. And we do that because um, when we share code with each other, we want it to be as replicable as possible. And if the if the pip installs are persistent, then the next person who used your notebook will not have the same environment. Um, if there's something that's really burdensome that you need to pip install and that you think multiple people here will use, let us know and we'll add it to the environment. Because um, we don't want you to have to deal with a ton if there's a ton of stuff that you need to do um, pip installs for. But the um, the right way to do this in your notebook is to put the pip installs at the top of your notebook. So then when you share it, uh, it's all replicated. Um, and the other thing that you need to know is how to shut down your server. So the servers cost money and these are fairly cheap servers, but in order to save money, what you can do is you can go to hub control panel and stop my server. And what that does is turns off your um, server and then you can log off over here in the top right. And that button will disappear once the server is stopped. Yeah. So it's gonna get angry at me now. Um, 
but it's under file and then you go down to hub control panel yeah so now this is this server has been shut down so that's why it's like yelling at me you can no longer use it um you have to restart it you can also in this in this area you can add you can start you can start a new server without actually logging out if you want to just bump up to a larger server um, but for now i'll just log out here um, and then log back in so this is like the original page that i should have seen um and so what that does is it shuts down your server immediately if you aren't using your server the nice thing is that after 90 minutes it'll shut down automatically um if you haven't been using it so don't worry if you like forget about it that's one of the things that's really cool about this infrastructure that you might not have somewhere else is that cost saving tool that shuts shuts off your server um, if you aren't using it. Um, so what I'm going to do now is switch back to the PowerPoint and So a little bit of housekeeping just to finish this off. Um, we have a getting started page for anyone else who needs to have access to this. Um, we want you to keep your personal storage below 50 gigabytes. And if you end up needing more, please come talk to us and we can um, we can we can talk we can talk about it and figure out if if what you need is feasible. So just so you know, in the background, two terabytes of data costs about $90 a month. So everything that we store in there costs a little bit of money. It's here, it's meant for you to be able to use. So like, don't worry about using it, but just be cognizant of how much storage you're using and let us know if, if it's getting to be large. Um, is, that, is that on S3 or is that on the instances SSD? So this is the, this is the instances. So S3 is about half this um, cost to store data. So if it's in an S3 bucket, but our personal storage and our shared file storage, yeah. all of that is a slightly is a is a slightly more costly um, storage, and it allows us to like e all easily access it. Um, we are discussing community S three buckets, so if you need an S three bucket, you're working on a team. Dennis Felixson just created an S three bucket um, that that his team uses, so there's options for you guys scanning those up. Um, as I mentioned, pip installs are not persistent. Um, please use percent pip install. And um, I mentioned the hub, the hub shutdown. So for troubleshooting, um, we have a community to work together to do to answer questions. So places where you can get help is if you need to, you can go to the Slack um, channels that we have and ask questions about the hub. You can report issues like specifically about the technology if there's an error or anything like that with within um, the GitHub issues. You can go to uh, for general hub questions and troubleshooting that are not just specifically CryoCloud. You can go to the discourse, um, the Pangeo discourse page, and um, our CryoCloud team will help you with whatever you need. So if you don't know where to go, just ask on um, the Slack channel or CryoCloud. Um, crown the cloud at mines.edu. Also, if you use our cloud, we would love it if you would cite us in your papers. Um, we have this Zenodo link here. This is our Jupyter book Zenodo link, but anytime you use crowd cloud and you publish, um, please add our um, citation there. And if you have slides, if you have tutorials, things like that, that you want to add, um, you can add to our Zenodo community and we can get a, a DOI for you there as well. Here's uh, the links for everything that we've talked about. Our website, Hub, Jupyter Book, which is where all the tutorials are going to be. Our GitHub is the code location for all of this and our Hub infrastructure, um, our Slack channel, the Pangeo discourse and citing in our, our Zenodo community. Here's some Q Greenland links because um, I went over Q Greenland. So there's documentation and the tutorial for using Q Greenland if you want it. And then if you want more skills beyond that, um, you can go to um, the ISAT2 
uh, data and processing tutorials that are in the ISAT2 Hack Week. They have their own GitHub. Um, for NASA data access, you can go to our book or the NASA OpenScapes cookbook. There's other cookbooks out there um, that you can use. We're probably going to provide some advanced skills tutorials um, for parallelized computing and for other things. Um, I can potentially do a tutorial on sync thing or something like that too. And then definitely participate in the ISAT2 Snow, SnowX Ocean or Cloud Computing Hack Weeks. They're phenomenal for getting a lot of cool up to date, like the, the coolest, newest code out there uh, is developed um, in these hack weeks and you get an entire week to work in the cloud. So with that, well, thank you there. Um, we have an exercise to go through um, before we do our next project, and then we'll have a break. Um, yeah. Um, in terms of data access, it looks like you have like ISAT and remote and like credit score things. For stuff that's being provided by organizations, like in the cloud on like Amazon S3 or something, like and professional stuff is up there, like now data is. Are those sorts of things that you could somehow pipe into from Cloud Cloud, or are they in like separate walled clouds that go onto each other? Yeah, so the question is um, things that are in the cloud and S3 buckets, can we access them? So if they have public access, then yes. Um, basically, everything that NASA has is accessible. There's some Sentinel um, buckets that are available. Uh, yeah, you, you can access them if they're public. Um, and then you can also like read in and access things, even if they're not in the cloud, you can read them into like X-ray and stuff like that with a URL. Any other questions right now? I'm wondering, um, you mentioned cloud computing hack week. Is there, uh, any like cryo focused kind of cloud computing hack week or? So the ISAT2 two one, ISAT2 and SnowX are both cloud computing, um, ones that are focused. Uh, uh, Tasha, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to interject. There is not going to be a SnowX Hack Week this summer. Um, and there is not, uh, I think that was Twyla asking, there is not specifically a cryosphere focused cloud hack week. Um, it will be generically ISAT to cloud hack week uh, for this summer. We'll be sending out some information for people who want to join the organizing team uh, shortly. Cool. Yeah. All right. So for this task, um, I'm going to open up this server option and let Wilson chat through. Yes. Hello, everyone. I'm Wilson. Um, and yes, I'll walk you through this quick exercise and then we'll have a quick bio break for everyone to get up and grab some coffee and whatnot. Okay. So um, you'll log into CryoCab if you have not already. Oh, yes. Oh, right. Yes. There we go. Okay, we'll get this booted up. And then what we'll be doing is we'll be cloning the repo of the CrowdCloud website because it's got it's where we house all the tutorials. So if you are on a web page, what you can do is just go to cryointhecloud.com. Yes, and then from here, as Tasha mentioned, there is both um, the hub access here that we just logged into, and then there's also uh, the Jupyter book here. Um, so if we go to the Jupyter book, um, uh, Tasha mentioned this, so this is where we access a lot of things, but then we can also get to the source code by just clicking on the GitHub logo up here and going to the repository. Okay, so now we're in the repository. Now that we're here, we're just going to click on this blue code, or excuse me, green code button, and then we'll copy the link. And then we'll go back to our hub. And then from here, we'll open up a terminal. Uh, command line. Okay, great. So um, now we can see we're um, in the base. 
uh, environment. So we're just here in our file browser. We're just in the main. If you did want to organize the your GitHub repos, like let's say you've got your own GitHub repos that you want to clone to your directory, you could have a folder for repos. You could have a folder for your own repos versus ones you're contributing to. Um, so you could uh, change directory to a specific folder if you want to organize things a bit. And as you build all of your workflow in here, you'll want to be a bit more organized. But for right now, we're just going to get cloned to um, where we currently are, which is that main folder. So we'll just do git clone, and then we'll paste that URL and click enter. Uh, so I'll take um, a little bit. It's just copying everything that's in there. Uh, the command is git clone, and then that URL from the website. If you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand and I'll come over. Yes, please. <laughs> How are folks doing? Perhaps raise your hand if you need a second more. And yeah, this is the task for now. So if you are done, you can take a break. Um, we'll break for about five minutes and then we'll come back and we'll start running through that tutorial. Okay, we are back from break and getting started. Okay, so recall we did a git clone and Yes, we did a git clone of all of the fold files that are on the CryoCloud website, which includes the tutorials. So now in our file browser here on the left, um, you can open that up if it's not open and then find your CryoCloud website folder and just click into that. It's a GUI, just like you'd interact in like File Explorer. Um, and then from there, you'll wanna go into the book. So this is what builds the Jupyter book website. And then from there, these are the different folders that hold the contents. We'll go down to tutorials. And then we'll go into this folder that's uh, is2 underscore atl15. And then from there, we'll pull open the one notebook that's in there. And I'll give you all a second to navigate there and a second for it to load. So for this, you're welcome to follow along, or you can just watch as this goes through. Um, it's easy to just press like run for each of these, um, but it's totally fine if you just want to watch to um, to watch and not necessarily run it in your own command or in your own cloud. Yep, all these tutorials will be on the website. You can, like we're doing here, get clone them and then run through them interactively. Um, but there'll also be a rendered version on the website that you can also look at there. And then we're planning to have uh, a recording of this tutorial. Your current stop. Oh, that's not fun. Okay, so sometimes, oh, yes. One one quick addition here. Uh, when you're looking at your uh, at your screen, what you'll notice is a bunch of information down here. So right here, it says main. That's like where we're kind of at in our Git um, repository. It says no kernel. That means we don't have a kernel working and we can't like actually run uh, this in the way that we need to says initializing, it's just going to sit there. It's not going to run properly. And then we see our memory down here. So our memory, 186 megabytes. If you watch that and then your, 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 your computer crashes when it gets to like the max amount that's allowed for a server, you can tell that by here because it'll get up to that, that limit and then it'll crash. Um, so that's another cool place where you can uh, find things that are useful. So basically to get that kernel going, 
uh, if it crashes, you can go to kernel and restart and then. Um, I will demo that now. So at the top, go to kernel and then just restart kernel. And then you'll just have to confirm. That clears everything. You just have to just run everything on your notebook again. Okay, so you can see it went from, um, um, now it's at idle. So our kernel is ready to go. Um, is everyone ready to move forward? Yes, very good. Okay, so the title of this is using ISAT2 ATL1115, which is a data product of ISAT2. It's the gridded uh, Arctic and Antarctic land ice type product. Today, we're just going to look at Arctic because we're at fogs. Uh, to look at uh, ice surface height anomalies, but we'll also run through quite a few of other things. Um, I wrote this tutorial along with Tasha and then uh, Jessica Scheich, who's um, who's been chiming in remotely, and Luis Lopez. Okay, so what we're going to learn today is we're going to learn how to gather data from different sources, both uh, cloud-hosted and non-cloud-hosted, um, cloud-optimized and non-cloud-optimized. We're going to learn about coordinate reference systems and why they matter. Uh, how to use geometries such as points and polygons to define an area of interest and how we can subset the data. And then basics of how the IcePix library simplifies obtaining and interacting with ISAT2 data and how we can use X-Ray to simplify the import of multi-dimensional uh, data. And then we'll open plot and explore um, the gridded data that's in ATL15. So we first have to set up our computing environment. Um, so you can see here, uh, we've got this tip up here that just tells you about the pip install. So there are many libraries that are already on CryoCloud, but for whatever reason, if you're interacting with a library that's not, you would just do pip install and then the library name, and you do it in its own cell and let that happen. Um, it does happen a lot faster than locally in my experience, but all the libraries that we're using today don't require that. So we'll just hit this first cell and run that. Um, what you can see is we're importing libraries, and then we're just defining a utility function that will convert long lat coordinates to uh, a um, XY coordinate system. Okay, great. So just a quick little crash course on subglacial lakes. There are two broad classes. There are stable volume lakes that have had a stable volume over the observational record, and then active lakes that episodically drain and fill when we've observed them. And we can observe those active fill drain lakes because they deform the ice surface above them as the water fills and drains in them. So because we're looking at an ice elevation product, uh, we can investigate those active lakes. So we'll look at those and we'll focus on ones that have been found in Greenland. So this is a, a recent uh, review paper that uh, collated an inventory of lakes across the world. And then they've got the two types in these uh, two different symbol types. So the active ones are in the blue triangles, and then the stable ones are in the red circles. So you can see we've got a few in uh, southwest Greenland and then one up here on this ice cap. Okay, great. So from there, what we can do is we can go to this paper, and they actually have put a data set up here in the supplementary information. So we're going to grab information from that. Um, I've already done that for you, so you don't need to do it yourself. It's this other file that's in the folder, so it's already living there. So what we did for that was we just went to the paper, we downloaded that data file, this supplementary data. It was downloaded locally to our computer, and then from there, it's very easy to upload. You can either be in your file file explorer, uh, let's see, so like um, here, and then you just find the file manually, and then from there, one moment. Um, how do you switch between screens? Because the command that I use on my computer is not doing that. Um, oh, maybe it's like the th three. Yeah. Oh, go from there it is. Ah, my apologies. Should have navigated away. Okay, yes. Um, so we can just drag and drop to where we want it to live. Um, or we can use this little icon here, which is the upload button. So that's one way to get data into CryoCloud if it's not cloud hosted, something like a um, ancillary data on a, a paper. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll read this data into a GeoPandas geodata frame to look at these lakes a little bit more. So from there, um, I just kind of walked you through how you would upload data. So this tells you how to do that. And then what we'll do is we'll use that uploaded um, CS, uh, Excel file, and then we'll just read it in. Um, so you can see here, we've read it into a Pandas data frame, easy peasy and we're looking at the, the top of it. Uh, but because this was downloadable 
via a URL. One thing that we can do is we can use this, um, this pandas read Excel method just on the URL itself. So if we know what the data set looks like, we can just download directly via a URL. So let's try that. And you can see we get the same result. Um, we do have to know a little bit about the file structure of that data first. Um, as you can see, I needed to know that I need to go to the sheet name Greenland. So in some cases, you will have to download this data just to familiarize yourself with its structure so that you know how to read it. But once you do that, um, it's very easy to import it just via a URL. Okay, so um, from here, we can increase the functionality of this pandas data frame. Instead, use a geopandas data frame. So the advantage of a geopandas geo data frame is it has this additional geometry column. And what that allows us to do is create shapely objects like points and polygons and lines and other things that can help us interact with this data uh, and have a bit more functionality. So what I'm doing is I'm just creating a geopandas geo data frame from that, that pandas data frame. And I'm creating the geometry from the long and lat coordinates that were in that data set initially. And so you can see um, we've got that same data frame. It still has the long and lat columns, but we've now created this new column that has a point geometry, which um, I believe if I remember from the paper correctly, this is just the centroid of the lake. Okay, um, at this point, are there any questions? We've already um, interacted data two ways. It's, uh, any any questions? If not, I will continue. Okay, uh, please interrupt. Just raise your hand. Um, same with online. Tasha is checking out the chat online, and so is Jessica. Okay, great. Um, so what we'll do is we'll just filter on lake types since we're interested in those active subglacial lakes that we can look at with surface height anomalies. So we'll just go into that uh, GeoPandas Geo data frame and filter on the lake type, and you can see it looks like we have six lakes um, across Greenland. And remember, we've subset to Greenland already because we were just reading that Greenland sheet on that bigger inventory. OK, great. So next, we're going to go into what is a coordinate reference system, or sometimes you will see EPSG. So this tells you how the Earth's 3D surface is projected onto a 2D plane map. Um, and you can see here's a few different examples from uh, data carpentry tutorial. These are really great tutorials just to kind of get some basic skills. I recommend checking out those if you have time. And this shows you how we can project the contiguous United States in different projections. And you can see they look quite different. Um, so it, it, it is important to pick uh, the one that's one going to make um, your, your data look the best as far as um, just interpretability of your map, but also um, another big issue with coordinate reference systems is they distort the land area because we're going from a 3D surface to a 2D surface. So I found this graphic from Earth Lab, which is another great set of tutorials that are focused on um, geospatial type stuff. Um, and you can see very intuitively on a human head what different projections do as far as distorting the different areas of a human head. Um, and that's the same thing happens with the continental land masses. Um, and then what is it EPSG? So this is just um, uh, what was a group that made these codes. It was the European Petroleum Survey Group. So that's why you'll see that a lot of times in code. Um, so yes, um, we want to minimize these distortions. So we usually select a projection that is localized to the area that we're looking at. So at Greenland, um, I think Joe yesterday mentioned you always want to use 3413. Uh, because it's the best projection for Greenland. It minimizes those distortions. Um, and so here's um, an example of that. If we were trying to uh, do a projection of the whole globe, um, we, we would be looking at something like the geoid, and then um, we do a global datum like the WGS84. This is the one that we're very used to, the long lat coordinates. But if we do something a little bit more localized, like looking at Greenland, we'd want to do a local datum. So that's what the 3413 uh, is doing. It's, it's um, maximizing the fit, minimizing the distortion uh, for that local region. Okay, um, and then, uh, yes. And then um, this kind of tells you about what, what a datum is. It's sort of your relative reference point. And I mentioned that just because ATL 15 does use a datum. Um, so thinking about what your datum is, is important for interacting with the data later. Um, and then there's just a couple other websites where you can look up CRS codes to find the most appropriate one for where, where you're studying. 
Okay, from there, what we'll do is we'll plot up this data just to see where the active subglacial lakes are, uh, just as a demonstration that we've imported all this data correctly. And I've got two separate plots. One is using that WGS84, uh, the long lat for global projection, and then one that's um, specific for Greenland, the 3413. Um, you can see for the long lat, uh, the, the top of Greenland, the more northern latitudes get really distorted. They get way thicker and bigger um, in that projection. Whereas if we use something localized, you can see it looks a little bit more realistic, less, less distorted. Okay, from here, uh, we will go ahead and use those shapely points that we made in the GeoPandas geodata frame. And then what we'll do is we'll expand from that point to create a search radius uh, and make a polygon around that point so that we can, one, search for data, and then subset data. And that becomes really important, especially for low-level data products, um, like the lower ATL numbers on ISAT. And we'll talk about what ISAT2 is in the data products in a second. But some of the data sets are quite large. So you don't want to download the whole thing. You want to subset as early as possible. Yes. So um, what we're doing here is we're just going to go ahead and create a geo series. A geo series is kind of like a GeoPandas geodata frame, but it's just more, it's, it's a little simpler. So we're just creating a new column essentially that takes our GeoPandas geodata frame and then converts it to the, um, we're, we're changing the CRS to be the Greenland CRS. So instead of being in long lat coordinates, we're now in XY coordinates. And then what we can do is this cool little method, method called a buffer. And so what this does is it just goes beyond that point um, and creates a shape around that point. So it'll create a polygon circle around that point. And I've just set it to be, since we're in XY coordinates that are in meters, I've just set this to be 10,000 meters, so 10 kilometers. And then I'm just making a copy of, of this GeoPandas geodata frame and adding that new geometry as the column. So instead of the point, it'll now be the polygon. So I'll just run that. And you can see it's the same thing, but in, now instead of having points for our geometry, it's now a polygon. So it's a circle around that original point that is has a 10 kilometer radius. So that's our search radius around the active subglacial lakes that we are looking at. <laughs> Yes, okay, so what is ISAT2? I've been talking about it a lot. Uh, this is NASA's Ice Cloud and Land Ele Elevation Satellite 2. Uh, we got a little bit of intro from about that from Dennis yesterday, so I think you're somewhat familiar with it, but just to refresh your memory, it is a laser altimeter, so it uh, beams out laser pulses, and then it looks at, it gets the range once it reflects and comes back to the detector, and then from there, we can get elevation um, the elevation below the satellite because the satellite knows where it is um, using various methods like looking at the stars above it uh, um, and uh, GPS. Okay, so it's got uh, three pairs of, of, of beams, so six six lasers total. And so we get a lot of a lot of great information from the satellite. Um, the, the coverage of the data is so dense that what they can do is take these point measurements and rasterize them into a grid. And so that's the data product that we're going to be looking at. So there are two coupled data products that go together. There's ATL14, which is this really high resolution, it's 100 meter resolution digital elevation model that um, is, um, is of the ice sheet surface. And so this can be used for like ice sheet modeling and other things like that. And then ATL15 is the accompanying height changes that are differenced from that reference DEM. So we're just gonna look at ATL 15 today because we're interested in those height changes versus the that digital elevation model surface. Okay, so now what we'll do is we'll stream this data set from the uh, NASA Earth Data Cloud. And I've got a couple links in here that will walk you through um, how to find and access cloud-hosted data. So this is a little how-to guide from NASA Earth Data. Um, so this is great to, to check out when you've got some, some free time. And then this second one is this complete list of cloud-hosted data sets that are available from the National Snow and Ice Data Center. Uh, so these are both great to check out. Okay. So what, what we'll do is we'll use a library called IcePix. And Jessica uh, online is our resident expert in IcePix. Uh, she uh, developed this portion of the tutorial. 
So I hope I do it justice. Um, so it's a it's a it's a, a package just like any other one that you would import into a library. But what it does, uh, one of the things, one of the many things it does is it simplifies is the it simplifies the um, the authentication with the Amazon Web Services S3 buckets. So what we'll do first is it takes either like a shape file or a KML or a geo package as a search radius when you're trying to search and subset data. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that GeoPandas geodata frame that's got the polygons for a search radius. And then I'm just gonna take one, I'm gonna look at the one active subglacial lake that was up in Northeast Greenland on the ice cap. And I'm gonna spit this out into a file, into a geo package. And that's what I'll use to search with ice picks. So that's what that cell is doing. You can see in my file directory, I created that new file. And then from there, I'm gonna start with these different um, arguments that are that go into the ice picks query object. So we've got a short name, which tells us which data set we want to look at, ATL 15. And then we're looking at the spatial extent, which is uh, that um, geo package that we just made, which is that polygon that we made earlier. And then we're just going to feed it a date range. So we'll do that. And then we'll query for that object. And so it's set it up in this uh, region. Um, object. And then from there, we can do different methods on that to um, just confirm that um, everything that we thought we did, we did. So one thing we can do is we can visualize the spatial extent, and it will create um, an interactive view of where that is. Well, this is loading. Are there any questions? This is usually faster. I feel like it's because we're all on here, maybe perhaps. Ah, uh, yes. Oh, and it worked. Okay, great. So you can see we've got this interactive visual. Um, it uses bouquet, which is a uh, um, and GeoViews, which are two libraries to visualize data interactively. So we can see here, we've got some tools on the right. So we can click on some of those and we can actually uh, zoom uh, and pan, Let's see. Yeah, so we can zoom out here uh, and just confirm that yes, we are looking at that ice cap. Yep, that's right. And again, we're looking at that polygon circle that we've made around the point at that active subglacial lake. Cool, so that's looking good. And then from there, we can do this other method to look at the available data granules. Okay, so it looks like there are four, it tells us the, the total size of all of them and then what the average size is. And then from there, we can get the granule IDs. And then we're gonna feed it in these arguments telling us, uh, letting us know what the IDs are. And then um, that if they are cloud hosted, cloud equals true. So uh, Jessica, Jessica did a lot of work uh, this past week to make this this work, um, since a lot of this data is recently cloud hosted. And so we actually get the S3 URLs for this data product. And you can see there are four, because for ATL 15, there are four different resolutions available. So we can see that in the file name. It's the ATL 15. Um, we're looking specifically at Greenland. That's the GL. And then it's got the various uh, resolution. So we'll just go ahead and look at the finest resolution because why not? And that's what this cell does is it's just um, indexing to grab that last one, the finest resolution one. And let's see. Yeah, yes. Um, so, so if for whatever reason you are using a data set that is doesn't have something like ice picks to easily access the data. Um, you can go to Earth Data and search for the data set itself. So I've got a link in there that brings you how to do that. So this is just a how-to guide from NSIDC. But if you go to um, NASA's Earth Data Search, it's relatively simple. It's just a matter of clicking a box that says that it's a cloud-hosted data set. So here, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this. Is kind of um, a GUI interface to search for these data sets. But um, yes, so we can do that same thing rather than interacting with a library, for instance, for something that um, was not ISAT2 related. So we just search the, the 
for the name or some keyword. And then we just want to click available in Earth Data Cloud, and that'll pull up the cloud hosted data sets um, for faster streaming and whatnot. And then we'll go up here and just search that keyword. And you can see we get the same thing. We get um, there's ATL 14 and 15, and there's a lot more granules here because it's for the different regions. And we just queried for Greenland and then the various uh, resolutions. So that's how you search for it. Okay, uh, but thankfully we have IceFix to simplify all that for at least for ISAT2 data. And then from here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna authenticate through Earth Data. This allows us to use those S3 URLs. Okay, so it's telling me I, I've authenticated, I think, because I've recently done this and uh, used a token versus my password. Um, so I'll give you all a second to authenticate with Earth Data, and please raise your hand if you're running into any snags. You should have a box that opens that asks for your user ID, and then you type in your user ID, and then it asks for your Earth Data login password. Uh, you have to have an Earth Data uh, user ID and password to be able to do that, which was in the email that I sent to you. If you haven't been able to do it yet, you can do it after this. How's everyone doing? Anyone still working on it that needs help or time? Oh, so um, you're now authenticated. There's an error going on right now in the system. So this this part right here is not normal. They're doing some sort of maintenance with NSIDC and dealing with these um, end user. They're they're playing with the end user um, end user license agreements. These are things we'll show you in just a minute. They're really uh, they're one of the few places that haven't been streamlined with um, Earth Earth Access. But basically, you have to provide. Uh, an end user license agreement, you have to click that you accept it in Earth Data, depending on the product or the DAC that you're using. And right now they're playing with the EULAs at NSIDC. So this doesn't work the way that it's supposed to. This runs. This next one is normally how you would finish authentication. That doesn't work right now because they're playing with that. Um, so that information is there for you. But uh, we have a workaround that's right below that. So you'll see you get this error for this next line then we manually add the credentials here for the s3 file system and you're authenticated that you that last line you shouldn't need um once nsiec finishes this maintenance yeah so we've got a workaround right now that we just went through um so the last cell executed properly so we should be able to open up this data set um, so you can see we're just using that S3 URL and we're opening it with this S3 library and we're opening it with a X-ray data data set. So that's loading now. And then once that gets loaded, uh, one uh, there's multiple ways that we can acquaint ourselves with this data product. So there's the overview page, which kind of gives you very basic information. And it also has all the links to download this data set from the NSIDC. Um, so yeah, some really basic information, the CRS, uh, the resolution, things like that, uh, where it is spatially and whatnot, and then all the different download mechanisms. Um, but we are streaming, so we don't need to download. Um, that is one way, but it is very overview information. So another way that we can do this um, is we can look at the data products data dictionary. So this gives every field that's in the data and a description of what it is. So if you see a weird keyword, then you're not sure what it is. This is the plated place to go to figure out what it means. Uh, but luckily, we're doing some we're doing something very simple. We're using geographic coordinates and delta H, um, which we can find in here. But I think you all can kind of guess what that is. 
so yeah, um, these are so long that a, a keyword search is very helpful. So you can see there's a whole group for Delta H and then there is a variable Delta H. So it's a float um, and it is our quarterly height change at, at um, this resolution. Um, so this resolution is that coarsest resolution, but we actually downloaded the finest resolution one. So this is actually um, at a finer resolution. And then another way that we can do this, another fantastic benefit of X-ray is a lot of this information is in the X-ray data set. So you can see um, if you're interested in Delta H, um, there's this little note icon that you click and it will tell you that same information, um, height change relative to the datum surface. Um, but it is nice to be able to look at the data dictionary and um, other things, because sometimes the descriptions are a little bit different in each place. So it can be helpful to look in multiple places as you're familiarizing yourself. Okay, and then there's a third document that um, I don't consult frequently, but it is there if you need it. It's the algorithm theoretical basis document. So it's kind of the nitty gritty of how all of this stuff is uh, calculated. And for a graded product, that is kind of interesting, but definitely sort of in the weeds. Okay, and then um, from there, um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at height change per quarter. So uh, all of this stuff is relative to that datum, the ATL 14 product, that DEM. So there's two ways that we can deal with that. We can either subtract the datum directly, or we can do is we can just difference two different time slices. So one quarter to the next, because it has um, an orbital repeat of about 90 days. So about a quarter of a year. So we'll do that method. Um, we just subtract one time slice from another. And you can see because the datum is embedded in there because it's the difference from, um, if we do the math out, the datum disappears and we just get the difference from one time to the next. So that's what we'll be doing. So this is just a plotting function that uses that delta H data variable. And um, yes, you can see here, we've got height change and then it's a divergent color bar indicating um, you know, if it increases or uh, if it decreases um, from the previous quarter. So you can see a lot of it's near zero, uh, but you can see, we don't see a whole lot of change, but that's because of the color bar that it's automatically done, but we can see some stuff along the margin, but we can, um, to, um, we can change the color bar bounds a little bit so we can see a little bit more of the data structure and we can just explore um, that height variable. So the DHDT, that was just a subtraction of one time slice to the other DHs. And then we can find out what the min and max is. So we can just manually set it to that min and max so that we can um, see what that looks like. Okay, so we see a little bit more uh, and still along the margin, um, but then from there, we can zoom in even a little bit more and we can do um, an X-ray method. It's this quantile method. So we're just gonna look at 98% of the data. So we're gonna pull out those outliers so that we can uh, saturate the color bar and look at things a little bit more in depth. And so you can see it's um, interacting with the X-ray data set and it's making this new data array that tells us those quantiles that we put in. Um, so there's lots of methods like that that are off of X-ray data sets that are very handy. Okay, so we'll we'll use those uh, quantiles and um, we'll change the color bar a little bit so that the they extend to indicate um, that there are some outliers that we're not quite plotting with the range that we've got there. And so now we can see a lot more of the data structure um, for the change from the first time slice to the second time slice. Okay, and then from there, um, what I'm doing here is just creating a function to plot this stuff so that what you could do is you could just put in the next lake, or you could make a for loop and loop through all six of those active subglacial lakes, or perhaps you're studying something else like, um, like, um, an outward glacier and you want to see how it's, how it's thinning through time or thickening, um, so that you can do this, um, more efficiently and, um, do, do, do a function so that you can, um, automate this in some way. Okay. Um, so I've made the function, and so just um, very quickly, what it does is it just uh, subsets our data set using the, the min and max x, y coordinates that we uh, developed, that we will develop later. And then what it does is it goes through and does that quantile method to um, take out those outliers so that they're just sort of at the, at the, bound, the boundaries of the color bar so that we can see more of that data structure in the continental interior since we're doing a, a, a bigger view. And then, um, and then it plots it up. And then I've got, um, you can kind of look through this code to maybe get ideas for, for your plots, but some of it is just to kind of make, clean up the axes, make them in kilometers versus meters, things like that. 
Okay, so let's just remind ourselves we've got six, six active subglacial lakes across the continent, and we'll just zoom into one. Um, um, I don't know how to pronounce that. Uh, maybe someone here does, but we'll, we'll look at that one. And we can actually do this method off of it to look at the geometry bounds. And so it'll give us the, the um, oh, yes, sorry. Um, there was uh, some editing last night that didn't quite make it in the last push. So um, as you're running through this, if you're doing it interactively, please delete what I just deleted, the geometry dot bounds. Um, I was just doing some playing around that didn't quite make it. I apologize for that. So just delete that. Okay, so we've got that stored. And that just has the min and max x and y. And what we'll do is we'll feed that in here. So remember, we're still in long lat in this GeoPandas geo data frame. So we're just assigning that uh, min and max x and y, um, which are long lat in the projection that we're in, to long and lat min and max for this particular lake. And then what we'll do is that we'll use that utility function that we had at the very beginning when we were setting up our computing environment. And we'll just convert this to instead be um, uh, X and Y coordinate that are in the Greenland projection, the 3413. And then we'll use that function that we just created. And then what that'll do is create a trellis plot that has the time series of all the time slices that are available in ISAT2 data. Um, so we can see here, um, Maybe should have put some some label some labels indicating what the time is, but these are quarterly steps of ISAT two data. Uh, doesn't look like there's too much going on. That might look like an active lake draining and filling, but this lake was discovered pre ISAT two, so it could be that it just doesn't have any activity. Uh, but you know, perhaps this one is is some something going on at the lake. A uh, little little hard to tell with this one, but you can play around with this um, if you if you go into um, these cells, you can always change the name, look at any of the other six lakes, or um, look at the lakes that are in Iceland or um, Europe and whatnot and, and explore a little bit more. Okay, so from there, um, another way that we can plot this is using hollow views. Uh, so this is uh, kind of like an alternative to matplotlib, but you can see it uses some backend matplotlib components. And this plots a, a very interactive version of the plots that we just made kind of like um, IcePix did using hollow views and okay to zoom in and out and pan um, and make some mild adjustments. And because this is a time series, it actually will put up a uh, like a play pause button. So you can start playing through those time slices and view it as you would view like a video or a GIF. So it's taking a second to load. Are there questions either online or in person? Okay, so it loaded. Um, you can see it, it um, has the look and feel of matplotlib, but we've got some additional functionality. Like I said, we've got that play pause button so we can start um, going through the time slices. Oh, I, I press pause apparently. Oh, got it. Okay, it's not one button, my bad. Okay, so you can see we're kind of strolling through the time slices. So yeah, that's a, a, a cool library to, to explore data in that way. Um, it's an alternative to making a your own function. Okay, so from here, we'll just kind of clean up our environment. Um, we, we're using this intermediary geo package file to search on this one lake that was on the ice cap. So we'll just use the OS library to remove that. So that disappears. Uh, next up is sort of a, a new part of this. this. This part was written by Luis Lopez. So we're going to stream cloud hosted data using this a new library called Earth Access. So this, uh, like IcePix, uh, simpl simplifies the authentication through NASA Earth data so that we can search and stream all the data sets that are available on NASA Earth data, not just ISAT2. This, uh, this is a follow on to Earth data. If, all of you, if anyone has used the Earth data library, this is basically the same thing, but it's the V7 version. Cool. Yeah, so we'll import that. Um, we'll just look at the version number since it's new. Um, it's kind of nice to know where we are. Okay, great. And then there are uh, three different ways that we can authenticate. We can set up as environment variables where we just do earth data username and then put our username. Same with the password. Uh, we could also store our credentials in a net, uh, .netrc file. Both of these are kind of suboptimal because it kind of leaves your password 
where someone else might see it. So we would not recommend that. Um, instead, we recommend using this interactive in notebook login, kind of like we did earlier with uh, the NASA Earth data through IcePix. Um, so because I authenticated earlier, um, it's saying that we're authenticated. I think if you run through that cell, it'll be the same for you. Okay, then from there, um, we can search um, using Earth Access. So you can see here, we're gonna use this search method off of it and we'll just use a keyword search. So we'll search for anything that's got the keyword Sentinel in it and looking for cloud hosted data. And then we'll use this uh, library pretty print to just make the printout a little bit more uh, readable. Um, so you can see it finds 129 data sets and then it gives us this summary uh, by printing that. And so we get a little bit of metadata about the, 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 oh, did you have something? Oh, mm. oh, right. Yes. Um, yeah, we're just seeing two, um, interesting. Okay. Yeah. We're just looking at two of these. Um, another way that we can search is instead of a keyword search, um, we can search for the data sets short name. So um, every data set has its own short name. So this is the, you can see we're gonna uh, get a little bit more information, not just the summary, but also the abstract. So we can see this HLS uh, S30, it's the Harmonized Landsat Sentinel-2. And um, yeah, a, a separate data set, a separate way to search for it. Now that we've searched for it, we found something that we're interested in. Now we can start searching for the individual granules from that data set. So there's two different ways that we can do this. We can either, either use a application programming in, interface, if you've heard of API, or we can build a query object. So in this tutorial, we'll do the, the query object, kind of like what we did with IcePix, where we made that query object, just because it has a lot more flexibility and customizability uh, and different uh, methods off of it that we can um, do things with. Uh, so first, what we'll do is we'll use this cool tool, bboxfinder.com. And so what this lets us do is it, um, let's us zoom into a region that we might be interested in, um, say it's Greenland or Iceland or Svalbard, um, we can zoom into the particular region and then it automatically provides us a bounding box of the map view, um, but we can also create a polygon um, rectangle around a region that we might be interested in and we can get the bounding box uh, coordinates from from that polygon. So either the map view or the polygon, and then you just click this copy button to copy those coordinates, which uh, we've done in this notebook already for Iceland. So if you don't wanna change anything, you don't have to, but if you wanna look at a different region, you definitely can. Uh, so that's what we put in here. These are the bounding box coordinates in this particular order of long lat, long lat, um, min max. And we're also searching for a temporal time range. And then we're using this concept ID, which is a ID that is specific to a data set and a particular version of that data set. So it's uh, highly specific. So we run through that. Um, it just um, gives us our query parameters that we already put in. Uh, if we do that method, the params method, and then we can look at the number of hits that are on that query object. Okay, it took a, a second. There's a lot of them. There's almost 5,000 hits. Okay, and there's a lot of other ways to search. So there's this link here that kind of walks through all the different methods. So, so a, a lot of ways to look at, at look for data. Okay, and then from there, what we can do is we can go to that granule list that we that we developed, um, and we'll just uh, we'll, we'll index and pull that first one off just to examine it. And then from there, what we can do is we can look at the data links of that granule. So you can see there is a ton, and that's because this particular data product has a bunch of bands. So each band of the data set has its own link. And you can see there in the TIFF format, earlier in the metadata, um, you may have noticed there in the cloud optimized GeoTIFF, uh, COG, you may have seen. Um, and then this is kind of talking about what Tasha mentioned earlier. Sometimes you may get an error, error, error as you're trying to download these that you haven't accepted a ULNA, this end user license agreement. And usually when the error comes up, it'll have a URL that you go to, and it's just part of the NASA Earth data where you log in and you essentially have to agree to the terms of use of that particular data set. Okay, so um, we can stream data with Earth Access. And if we've got enough memory that we're working with and, um, you know, 
as Tasha said, when we start on that login screen, we want to start small because usually we only need small. But if we need to bump up and use a little bit more memory, that's something that we can do at the login screen and stop our server and log back in with a, a, a great a larger, larger RAM if you need to do that. That's if you're reading in granules from an S3 bucket into your memory that's here on CryoCloud. And so um, Earth Access works the best with data sets that can be opened in X-ray. So these are things like um, uh, H5, uh, HDF5, NetCDFs, um, and then anything cloud optimized like ZAR and whatnot, and the cloud optimized GeoTIFFs and whatnot. Um, uh, but um, if you've got older legacy data sets, um, something like HDF or um, whatnot, they can be a little challenging, but we do have an example of how to open those. But um, um, for now, Earth Access works the best with newer data sets. So we'll give you an example of that. So again, we're using our Iceland bounding box and uh, we're looking for that harmonized Landsat Sentinel data. And we're going in a for loop through various years. And then what we'll do is we'll um, be, be searching per year and then we'll be adding all the granules as we go through the year. So we can see, um, We've got some granules in 2021 and 2022. And then from there, we'll do that same thing. We'll just look at the first granule to inspect it. We'll assign it a new um, variable scene. And you can see we've here we've got all the, the files, each for the different bands. And then um, we've got a little bit of metadata down here. OK, so there's kind of two ways we can get at these links. Um, there are the direct access links. So these are the ones that are from the S3 buckets. So these will let us stream. Uh, and then the other type of link are these external links, the ones that are available through the HTTPS. Um, these are not considered cloud hosted, even though they are on the internet. They're not um, the, the, the cloud uh, hosted data sets that we can stream easily. So what we want to do is preferably use those direct access links if it's got it. And you can see we pop those up. And yes, it is an S3 link. And yeah, Hila. Can you explain a little bit why the like HTTP? It's not considered cloud hosted. I mean, I guess I don't understand quite the. Sure. Yeah. So for folks online, the question was, why is that HTTPS link uh, not considered cloud hosted? And I'm going to let Tasha answer. It's just the S3. S3 is where the, it's the S3 bucket and HTTPS okay. is like the URL that is on prem. So this is like if you are accessing data through the NSIDP website and it's you, you aren't accessing it's just a, it's a different location a different url for it so um before cloud hosted you were accessing https um links when you download data so if you take that https there that link there and you paste that into your browser or whatever you will get a download data like where do you want to save this mm -hmm. um so S3 allows you to stream it, and why that's really cool is, especially if it's cloud optimized, you can only you can you can grab just a portion of the data instead of all of it. Um, whereas with this, you have to grab the entire thing. Like you can't just grab a chunk of it. So S3 actually, um, if it's cloud optimized data, allows you to um, to grab just a small subset of the data if you want to. Okay. Um, we aren't showing that here. You can you can open either one of them completely into memory without downloading it from HTTPS or S3 if they're in the right formats. But um, yeah, into memory on Cloud Cloud. Yeah. Thanks, Tasha. And for cloud newbies, uh, on-prem is short for um, on-premises. So this would be a data file that is uh, housed at like a computer that's like at an SIDC. Okay, great. Um, so from there, we can go ahead and plot this up. And again, um, we are using the um, S3 link to open this, and we're using Earth Access to open the file. So not only did we search for it, authenticate with it, but we're also using this library to open the file files, um, which I guess is using, well, um, we're using Raster.io to open, but then we're relying on Earth Access to open the granule. So I guess we're using kind of two libraries to open it. And so you can see um, it opens it here um, with uh, Earth Access, and then Raster.io uh, um, will open it so that we can plot it here. 
Um, so you can see here. And then um, because I had a, a magic function earlier in the notebook, um, the matplotlib widget, um, we've got this functionality on the side where we can interact with this uh, a bit and zoom around um, if we are patient enough. It is a large file, so we might not be patient enough. But it does, oh, there you go. It lets it kind of move around. And then as you hover your cursor, it's got information about the coordinates. So that is handy. Okay, so from, from here, what we'll do is we'll um, open this up into X-Ray so that we can view the data, um, not just a visual of, of, of it, but actually uh, look at the raw values. So we've got the band data and then the coordinates. And you can see, um, looking at the notes, uh, we can also look at those, what how many values there are, that sort of thing. Okay, so next up is sort of um, the non-ideal working with legacy data formats, which we will have to do because there's data that we want to go back and look at, especially if we're doing time series or whatnot. Um, and until things are hosted in cloud optimized formats, which I'm sure won't be the fastest process, we'll have to kind of work around. So this is a way to work around. We're going to look at this data set. It's uh, Mod 07, which is uh, atmospheric profiles um, from the moderate resolution imaging radio rate uh, spectro radiometer on the Terra satellite. So this can be used to do atmospheric corrections on visual imagery so that we can get a surface reflectance measurement. That would be a, a use case for this. So it uses a HDF5 file, or excuse me, not five, it's older than that, HDF file, HDF EOS file. So much older. And um, while we could technically stream it, um, the only libraries that are able to open that type of file are not used to that kind of input of a, a URL versus a, a file location of where the data would be located on your local machine. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to download it to CryoCloud and then pull the data from a folder that we have on CryoCloud. So we'll search for it using the Earth Access again. So we've just changed our parameters. We're still looking at Iceland, but now we're looking at the short name for that for that um, MODIS or yeah for the MODIS data for the atmospheric profiles. And we've got nine granules that we can look at. And again, we can look at the uh, access links. So you can see there's a direct access and then an external link. So it is cloud hosted, but because it is that older data set, we have to do this workaround where we can use a library that could actually open it and is used to opening um, from like a file location versus a URL. Okay, so we'll demonstrate that trying to, trying to open something in X-Ray, which would be the ideal. Uh, so we'll do this open multiple um, data sets here because uh, we've got a few granules. So it is trying, it's opening with earth access and it does that part properly. But then we get this error when we try to open an X-Ray. Uh, it just doesn't have the right compatibility. So womp womp. Um, so what we would do is we would use, uh, let's see. So um, what we need to do is download this to CryoCloud and then interact with it with an older data set that is used to a file file path versus a URL. So that's some code to do that. We'll pull in this PyHDF um, library and just a couple of functions from that. And that's how we would read this. So here's an example of that. So we've got our granules list. Do, do you want to add something, Kasha? Oh, yeah. The, the code in red there is if you want to open an HDF4 file, which is this format, then you can use that code to read it in. We're going to show you how you don't need to use that, how you can convert it so that um, you have a NETS NC4 file that you've converted to, and, and then you can uh, open it in X array, which wouldn't be possible without that conversion. Thank you, Tasha. I said that completely wrong. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we are going to pull off um, this HTML link here. And then from there, what we can do is you can replace the HTML endpoint of this URL instead with net uh, NC4. So we're gonna do that for all of the granules that we're looking at. Uh, so we'll do that. And you can see it's done that perfectly. The URL is the same, but instead of HTML, we've got NC4. Okay, and then from there, what we can do is we can go ahead and download that in that new format. So that worked. And then you can see here, it created a folder as we told it to, and it should have the data in there, and it does. 
Okay, from there, what we can do is we can, um, and we can also explore all of this in a notebook cell um, to see where these are. So we're just looking in that folder and then pulling out all the file names that are in there just to confirm that it's there. And then from there, um, we will navigate to that folder directory so that we can access those files. And you can see now we're in that folder um, here in the notebook. And then from there, what we'll do is we'll open the first file within there in X-Ray, which is of course optimal. And hey, it worked. Um, so that's a way that you can kind of get around these older file formats by converting them to a different file format and then downloading them to CryoCloud and then opening them in X-Ray. So as you get this rich data that's available when you open something in X-Ray like this, you've got all the data variables, you've got the coordinates, um, you can see 29 data variables, um, and then you've got all the attributes. So all the information you need is right there with just a few lines of code. If you tried to do this the, the old fashioned way with this older library that um, we had up here, um, you would really, you would spend so much time putting in code to pull in every aspect of the data set. This is just a way to get all the, all the data that you might need and look at it in all in one place. Okay, so um, uh, if we wanna clean up our data set a little, if we no longer need those uh, files, what we can do is we can interact with the file browser over here. Uh, we might want to just, hey, I want to delete this folder, but it, it won't let us because it has contents. So if you want to delete something here in the file browser, you actually have to go through and delete all the contents. Um, you, can, you can delete programmatically um, the whole file folder, but if you want to do it from here, you have to go into the folder. Yeah, so programmatically would be kind of like some of the earlier examples where we use the OS library to remove things. Um, so just showing you a different method to, to get at that if you prefer um, using GUI every once in a while. Uh, and it looks like there might be something still in there, some like hidden file. So this would be a case where we would need to do it programmatically. Okay, great. Um, so from there, uh, we have reached the end. Congratulations, you've completed this tutorial. This is just kind of a summary of some of the skills that uh, we went through and um, some references if you were interested in any of those data sets or any of the figures that got plotted in this, in this paper. And then um, I know we kind of rushed through this and some of the cells are perhaps convoluted and there's a lot, a lot going on. So if you wanted to reach out to me, my website's on there and all my contact information, I'm happy to chat about this particular notebook or about anything CryoCloud. Thank you for being here. Yeah, Jessica? Uh, I was just going to build on what you were saying before uh, with the EULAs, the end user license agreements. Um, if you're trying to access NSIDC data in particular, you should not have to sign any of those. Um, and if you do, please let myself and or Luis know. Um, NSIDC is currently in the process of switching the type of authentication mechanism that they use. And so um, actually, some of the errors that you saw come up during the tutorial didn't come up last week, and then they decided to test the system, and so they came up this week, and so we were able to get the fixes in there. Um, but if you have any of those types of issues, particularly in the next couple of weeks, please do let us know um, so that we can try and stay on top of, uh, on top of keeping, keeping those fixed in the software. Um, that would be super helpful. So thanks, everybody. Yeah, so that just kind of tells you so this some of this authentication that we've just done it's very streamlined in Earth Access and some of the work that's in Ice Picks is literally come out last week. So um so these are brand new tools. Everything's super cool. You're just getting being able to access some of this stuff literally in the last few weeks. Um so yeah, if there's bugs, let us know, let um let Jessica know and um we'll help you figure it out. All right, we'll see you back here actually at uh, 11, uh, 28. Hello everyone and thank you for working through the tutorials uh, that Tasha and her team have prepared um, to walk you through CryoCloud and how it may be incorporated into your uh, cryosphere related research workflows. Uh, my name is Michaela King and I'm a research scientist at the University of Washington and I want to quickly work through um, a brief tutorial of using some of the GRIMP 
uh, Grimp Jupyter Notebooks uh, that will help you access and process, manipulate, save, and work with some of the data sets associated with the Grimp project. And so this uh, page that I have pulled up here is the home landing page on NSIDC, the National Snow and Ice Data Center. Uh, this houses all of the data associated with Grimp, and Grimp is short for the Greenland Ice Mapping Project. Um, and so what Grimp is, is that it's um, basically like a, uh, a benchmark set of data sets, uh, primarily remotely sensed data sets, uh, that are made available so that researchers can observe how the Greenland ice sheet is changing through time and help monitor the stability of the Greenland ice sheet. So these are products like velocity, uh, changes in the terminus position, uh, imagery, so you can look at how the surface morphology has changed through time, um, backscatter reflectance, uh, digital elevation models, so how the elevation, how the surface has changed through time. Um, but am I forgetting anything? Uh, but if you if you go to nsidc.org uh, slash grimp, uh, then you can kind of work through the different uh, data products. One of the, the biggest products I think that grimp is known for are velocities, uh, both optical um, as well as uh, SAR, uh, radar velocity products. Um, anywhere from six or 12 day, which means you can resolve um, ice sheet flow speeds uh, with temporal baselines of a, about a week to more longer baselines uh, like quarterly mosaics or annual mosaics. And so um, to make these data sets <clears throat> more accessible, uh, Ian Jockin with uh, Scott Henderson uh, has um, they have prepared uh, a suite of Jupyter notebooks that perform um, a variety of functions like plotting routines, um, as well as really easily make publication ready plots, um, and then also just load in the data to examine it. Uh, so really uh, helpful functionality for just exploring the data, maybe select a region of interest. Um, with an interactive panel, and maybe you don't like that region, you can reselect it, sample the data, see what that looks like uh, before you have to download anything. Um, and this is all possible because most of the data sets are formatted as uh, cloud optimized geotiffs, uh, which make it really easy to read in a lot of the header information so you can get information like the variable, the variable names, um, file size, the dimensions of the different variables, uh, the um, coordinate system or the projection that the data set is in. Uh, you can get all of that information that you would want to know up front without having to do any kind of intensive local um, local reads or local downloading. And so for today's tutorial, I'm just going to show a couple examples of the um, some of the functionality in one of the Jupyter Notebooks. And these are all, all the Jupyter Notebooks prepared. Um, I'll just go, let's see, right here. If you go to the NSIDC page, uh, backslash grimp, um, you'll see a, um, a, a menu here on the right hand side if you go down to grimp data tools. Um, not only have we recently launched a YouTube page that kind of walks through the tutorials a little in a little more depth, kind of walking through a, like specific functionality. Um, so you can click on that. But if you go to this here, this grimp tools GitHub repository, this is uh, will will lead you to the public repositories where all of the notebooks are housed. Okay, so this kind of walks you through different options. Like you can run uh, the notebooks locally as long as you make sure that you download the environment file. Make sure you have all the um, the local environmental. Uh, variables as well as the appropriate versions of different packages, etc. So you can do everything locally, or you can run things within Binder. Um, uh, Binder basically kind of makes a, a snapshot of the environment that you need. Um, and that's good for things that you don't have to worry about downloading any kind of packages locally. It's But it's limited up to about eight gigabytes of, of memory. So if you're doing really memory intensive jobs, uh, Binder is probably not the answer, but it is great for just exploring. Or um, what we're going to work with now is doing everything in the cloud, cryo cloud. And so what's great um, about having cl cloud optimized geotiffs and um, public repositories on GitHub is that everything can be seamlessly transitioned to the cloud. Um, again, kind of alleviating any of the need for super intensive uh, local uh, memory intensive jobs or um, needing to have a really specific pre-configured environment on your local machine. Okay, and so um, 
I just want to click here just to show you there are several um, anything with a dot i pi and b uh, these are notebooks and if you just click on them um, they will explain at each notebook kind of what each one does um, but there's notebooks for working with uh, imagery as well as velocity data products, uh, notebooks that allow you to just totally work remotely. Um, there's also a notebook for generating a QGIS project. So maybe you prefer just to work with um, QGIS or in that interface, uh, that kind of ArcGIS-like interface um, and seeing it and kind of messing with the layers that way. Um, this will generate a really nicely organized QGIS project based on the variables and data products that you want, as well as um, it will also help generate the layer definition file. So everything is kind of nicely consolidated into subdirectories and everything to give you a really nice QGIS project to work from. So what we're going to work with today is the flow lines um, notebook. And what this notebook does, I'm going to click over. Um, this is showing my kind of my local view of uh, when I log into the cryo cloud. So if you registered uh, with cryo cloud, then you can log in and you and you have uh, an interface kind of looks like this. For the time being, I've just copied uh, the flow lines notebook just right in here into my uh, top uh, local directory. Um, in the future, if you actually go to the cryo in the cloud uh, GitHub repository right here, um, doo, doo, doo. So cry on the cloud and then we went to the cryo cloud website repository and then I believe here we go to book and there'll be a tutorials repository. Um, and so just like Wilson was walking through the, um, if he hasn't shown this yet in the video, he will show um, an example of walking through an ISAT 2 tutorial um, eventually within the next few weeks. Uh, this is being recorded in March 2023, but uh, pretty soon um, the Grimp tutorials will also be accessible here. So, you, so for the time being, I just have it copied uh, into my my local directory there. But you will be able to access this Grimp uh, tutorial uh, from this same repository here uh, in due time, or expect it within the next couple weeks. Okay, so uh, that's an, enough. I think of a. a preliminary kind of uh, uh, foundation basis of knowledge. So we are going to then actually get, do something fun and work through the notebook really quickly. You, I think by now, if you've been watching the tutorial, have already seen kind of the premise of what the Jupyter Notebook is and kind of how you interact in that environment. Um, so this flow line notebook, essentially the, the overall goal of the notebook is to bring in um, a shape file and the actually several shape files that are from a, another published uh, paper. This is by Dennis Felixson, uh, Jane Catania and others, um, a 2020 paper about nick points uh, in Greenland glaciers. And so the, this paper was also accompanied by a really nice data set of flow lines that started at the terminus of the glaciers and extended all the way inland to the, um, the um, oh my goodness. <laughs> To the ice divide. So you have these really nice flow lines and we're actually going to extract ice velocities from the GRIMP project um, at several flow lines and just plot them and kind of show how you can quickly access and explore this data. And so the reason why I chose this uh, notebook is because I wanted to demonstrate that it's not difficult to bring in um, other data sets alongside GRIMP. Um, if you have like a region of interest or a certain flow line, whether that be a vectorized data, um, et cetera, it's really easy to read that in and then, you know, grab GRIMP data that corresponds to those um, coordinates. Okay, and so one thing for right now, what I am doing, this, this, these first couple uh, cell blocks, this is where you're going to import all of the, the packages that are relevant to this notebook or the functions in this notebook. Um, if you kind of, you know, kind of scan uh, the list here, you see some of the familiar names, NumPy, Xarray, um, Matplotlib, uh, Glob Panel. Um, so some of these have already been loaded and installed in the shared CryoCloud environment. Um, we will pretty soon, um, at around the same time that the, the GRIMP tutorials will be on the, the CryoCloud uh, tutorial repository, um, these specialized, uh, this is NICER Dev, NICER is referring to an upcoming NICE, uh, NASA mission. 
uh, that measures um, instar velocities in Greenland and Antarctica, um, as well as GRIMP funk. So this is uh, a, a suite of GRIMP specialized functions, all um, backed by Python. Um, so because these are specialized packages, they're not really like a, a common one, obviously. Um, I'm going to pip install these from the top. So if you're looking directly from the GitHub repository, you won't see these two lines here, but this is just me um, pip installing these specialized packages to be able to run this notebook. In the future, the GRIMP uh, function and NICER dev uh, tool sets will be um, incorporated into the shared cryo cloud environment. So you won't need to do this. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and run that. And it might take a, a couple minutes depending on how um, your internet connection, everything, but it is all fairly, um, fairly expedited. I think all these uh, Python packages, just the names make me chuckle. NumPy, glob glob. <laughs> I don't know, it just sounds kind of like a Star Wars language or something. Okay. So we should be good to go. Okay, so here we go. It's one, it's not busy anymore. And um, if this hasn't been mentioned already, you wanna make sure that of course it doesn't say busy anymore until uh, before you uh, go on to the next cell. And I'm just shift returning um, to run each individual cell. Okay, great. And so what I'm gonna do here is I'm actually gonna read in um, the shape files from the Felix in 2020 paper. Um, I have, I'm kind of pointing directly to where I, I put these shape files. Um, this is in the shared public, um, shared public repository for now. Um, this may change with when we uh, upload the tutorial, but we can change the, the notebook accordingly. But basically you just want to point to wherever, um, this data set is, or if there's a different kind of shape file, um, that you want to read in, that's what we're doing here. And all of these options, and you'll see kind of specific ways to label axes or plotting colors or how many uh, glaciers we want to read in. This is all really adaptable. So this tutorial is supposed to kind of show um, a breadth of options, but you can make a copy or just totally edit within the notebook and, and specialize the notebook for your particular needs. Okay. Um, what I'm doing here is that I'm creating a dictionary of the individual flow line objects. So I'm going to read in flow lines at the first six glaciers. Um, and these first six include actually Jakob Schaumann, East Bray, um, and this is one of the largest glaciers in Greenland. Okay, and so you can see there's some uh, x, y, and distance. So there's some dictionary keys there. Um, I'm skipping through this kind of quickly, but please be assured that if you want to work through this in your own time, there's plenty of documentation before each cell that kind of explains what each cell is doing. Um, and then as well, if you would prefer to, um, let's see here. I think I'm going to do this right. Oh. Option shift. Oh no. Okay, there we go. So if you click within a cell, just push the down arrow. Um, this is within a, a Mac um, op operating system, but if you push down arrow, then it would bring up this box here that kind of explains in a little more depth the context of each cell. Okay, um, and so this is the fun part, the logging into the NASA, uh, the Earth Data login. So of course you need to uh, be registered with uh, Earth Data login to be able to access a lot of these products within other tutorials, as well as anything hosted at NSIDC, you need to be a, re a registered user and that's all free. Uh, it takes like five minutes. Um, I've already uh, previously logged in, so that's why I got this already logged in. You can proceed. Um, if you are logging in for the first time, you will see a panel that shows up where you can actually just have like an interface that you type in your username and then your password. And then it'll say, uh, you know, logging in, it, the text will be read until you're, you're good to go. Um, the, uh, your key that you've entered has been approved and then it'll turn to blue. So it's a nice little panel uh, user interface that you can log in there. Okay, and so um, what we're doing here then is we're loading this panel where you can actually explore the different data products um, 
the different velocity data products, this node NICESAR, this is just referring to INSAR, a SAR related um, velocity products in Greenland. And this is gonna bring up some of the different uh, options. And so we've already pre-selected, just for the case of the tutorial, we pre-selected the annual velocity mosaics that are derived just from SAR, synthetic aperture radar data. Um, and so you can adjust this if you like. You can adjust the first and last date so you have temporal uh, bounds and you can also then select the different NSIDC data products. Uh, the numbers of which, um, I let's see here. If you kind of go to uh, the NSIDC page, you can look there, they correspond to either annual, uh, quarterly, monthly, or the uh, SAR six and 12 day. So there are different data products over different temporal ranges, um, but for the sake of the tutorial, we're just gonna do the annual, all right? And it's kind of nice that you can kind of see exactly what the, the name of the GeoTIFF is. Um, and then, So the, what this is telling us is that if we were, so it's because it's a cloud optimized GeoTIFF, it's able to read in information about these uh, data files without um, incurring a lot of uh, memory intensive local storage. Uh, so it's just grabbing some of that header information. So if we were to download the entire uh, annual mosaic across Greenland, because we haven't uh, constrained this um, regionally yet, uh, this is telling us that it would be about eight gigabytes of data. Uh, it's broken up into four, uh, four megabyte chunks. Uh, but that's a lot of data, right? You don't, unless you're really, uh, you know what you're doing, you don't wanna just go willy nilly downloading eight gigabytes of data. Um, you can also see the projection, um, the, uh, how the arrays uh, are dimensioned. Um, and again, the, the time stamps involved with each. So there's a lot of fun things. You can kind of expand these and look at it. Um, expand them, close them, get a lot of information from this, this panel that is brought up here. So what we're doing now is that when we read in, I'm going to scroll without hopefully giving any, make anyone too dizzy. I'm going to scroll back up to where we uh, read in the flow lines. So what we did here is that we said, hey, let's truncate these flow lines from a totally um, external data set. We're going to trunc truncate these flow lines at 20 kilometers and just grab the first six. And so I want to base my region of interest where I'm kind of carving out my velocity data based on where these six flow lines are. So we are, um, we are establishing our region of interest or our bounds based on the outermost extents of these flow lines that we grab, the first six flow lines. And so that's kind of what we're doing here when we say my bounds equals here. And then we define my bounds by the bounds of the flow lines we grab. So it's sort of doing things backwards, but it could be nice if you like know you want the data at a certain flow line or at a uh, flux gate use, um, you can use a cell like this to say, well, tell me what my region of interest should be if I want to grab it at, at this, uh, at these coordinates. So that's how we have my bounds, um, which here, what we're going to do this subset vel, this is, um, this is a function within the GRIMP function, the specialized GRIMP tools. Uh, so now we're going to say, well, we don't all, we don't want the entire ice sheet wide mosaics, but we want to subset those mosaics by these bounds, these X and Y coordinates that contain the flow lines that we're interested in. Okay, and now we see something much more manageable. So this is um, about 34 uh, megabytes. So much more manageable. Um, again, all the same information as before, we just have a smaller uh, region of interest. Now we can load this into memory now. So up until this point, we haven't loaded any data into the uh, local memory. We actually don't have to do this to do plotting for the sake of today and just make sure things go quickly. I am going to load it into local memory and that'll make the plotting routines really quickly. But you actually don't have to do that. You could do, you could run, you could skip this and do all the plotting uh, without loading anything into local memory. It just might be a little more time intensive to plot multiple iterations um, of flow lines or through multiple time steps of velocity data if you are accessing the data at NSIDC each, uh, each loop. So depending on your, the size that you're dealing with, you might choose to just uh, read it into local memory and plot, or um, you could also choose to skip this and then just be a little more patient with the plotting. Okay, and so um, 
the commented out text, this is just explaining what each little line of code is doing. Uh, once you work through this on your own, feel free to you know adapt any of these um, uh, any of these uh, options uh, to best fit your needs. Um, but this is just showing how quickly you can get um, a nice plot. So this is showing the first annual velocity map in 2020, or maybe not the first. I think it's just grabbing 2020 based on, oh, yes, okay. Uh, but you could adjust this, right? You could um, change the index and select a different velocity map of the ones we loaded into local memory. Um, and then we're plotting over top. We are plotting the flow lines. We're labeling the flow lines. And then we are showing um, the intersection with the flow lines, I believe, how far is this? is 10 kilometers upstream of the front. So that's where this, these red dots are here. So really easy to do, and it's super fast. Um, and let's see, and I'm gonna show one more uh, plotting. So then you could plot these central flow lines at different times. So not only can you look at the data spatially, then you can also then extract the velocity and look at time series instead. Mm -hmm. So now I'm looking at just one flow line, flow line six. So this is going to be um, a center flow line. So what I'm doing here is that I still want to look at change through time at all the glaciers, but I'm just gonna grab like a center flow line um, and then look at how that center flow line velocity has changed at each site through time. And so here these plots are showing, okay, on X axis we have distance from the front uh, the colors correspond to different years, and then you can look at the center flow line, how that has accelerated or decelerated through time. And so again, you can change these to then look at monthly variability, um, but I think the annuals are kind of like a nice demonstration to see um, where things have changed. So Glacier 0001, which one is that? Okay, oh, so this is the southernmost branch of um, Yakutov, and so that's no surprise that that has in fact sped up, well actually no, blue. So it did decelerate and then it's starting to kind of rebound a little bit, um, which if you are kind of close at all to Greenland glacier um, gossip, it was kind of a big deal for a bit that uh, this, you know, the giant in the Arctic kind of decelerated for a bit, but then it's kind of back on its, back on its normal behavior and uh, has to sped up just since, you know, 2021. So uh, this is just fun to play around with and you can kind of change these then rerun cells um, and kind of get a quick look at what what these glaciers are doing. Um, I'm not going to run through all the remaining cells um, just for the sake of time, but do know that most of these notebooks then include at the end um, some cell options if you do want to save the data sets locally. So um, you could replace this, anything within these um, quotes here, you could replace that with a name that best suits, you know, actually what you're downloading, uh, but this these cell blocks will save the subset of data, um, the subset of data products, so sp sp specifically the data products that you downloaded, whether that be the annual mosaics, uh, monthly data, quarterly, or maybe imagery, maybe you're not looking at velocities at all, um, but you can save them then to um, a net CDF. And those will save, if you're working within the cloud, those will save, um, if you don't specify a path name, it'll just save to the directory you're working from or you're running the notebook from. And then you can copy or save that you know, locally or whatever best suits you. Uh, but that's, that gives you a quick option just to save um, the specific subset of data sets that you want uh, to uh, locally or within the cloud to save locally later on or never. Maybe you wanna work entirely in the cloud, which is great too. So um, I just wanted to show you a quick snapshot of some of the functionality and please you know, feel free to kind of explore uh, some of the other uh, notebooks as well. Um, and all of the um, information and documentation is within these fast ice. So the fast ice is the, um, the GRIMP kind of home GitHub repository. And then from there, if you look at, there's um, the notebooks here, has all the documentations and, and uh, there's really a lot of text to kind of walk you through that. So next we're going to have a tutorial by Mark Von Stock showing us how to access its live data. Okay. 
it'll be okay. So I, I'm not going to actually work through a notebook. Um, I'm going. You 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 are welcome to copy a, a really simple URL and look a web page. Um, I, I'm uh, I'm a bit short on time, so I'm going to just make it really brief. One of the things that you're running into is that is is that all of the there, there's sort of like AWS is almost impossible even for somebody who's really technical to use because they have a billion options. There are a billion data sets now. And so what I'm going to try and talk to you about is just just a really quick way to figure out whether or not what the signal you might be looking for exists in the its like data set, the, specifically in the image pair velocity data sets. And that's it. I'll just show you that. Um, and how you might go about that doing it on a web page, uh, doing it in a, in a browser. So, um, we'll just do it here. Is yeah, that going to work need, for you? I just, I just need the web page. Yeah, I just need the browser. Page. Okay. Um, you're just going to have to navigate here because, oh, okay. so, of course, something stopped working. No, that's fine. That's, okay. Yeah, I'll just make that window a little bit bigger so that people can see it. You can't hear the screen. <laughs> and just put the browser here. The, sure, it doesn't matter. That's the problem. Oh, okay. oh, here we can fix that. Um, one second. Here on the screen. Well, it's okay. I can. I can. Um, oh, that's why we couldn't find it because it was over here. Oh. So I, if you're just. If you're just uh, sitting at your computer at in a browser and you type in the URL, I'll di now dictate to you. It's m a p p i n dot it's live ice flow dot science. No underscore. All. Of them. So. Hmm. This is it. But well, we we'll get there. Yeah, that's yeah. Thank you. Um, it's m a p p i n dot it's live ice flow dot science. So so m a p p i n is just a, a in development name that the person that wrote this JavaScript that is now running in your browser. That you're not seeing the same screen I am, and and we'll get to that. The screen you are actually we can just do. Let's just go through this the long way around. Um, it's there. Yeah, thanks. Um, all right. So the person that wrote this is a is a senior undergraduate computer engineering major. I happen to know him because he's my son, but the this website didn't he, he's also somebody that that works for a startup writing javascript code and there there is no server between you and the entire data set right now the only compute that's happening other than the s3 bucket being there out there in the cloud and and that takes compute but the only compute that's happening right now is happening in your browser Right, that's this almost true of all the Jupyter Notebook stuff, all of the functionality and file moving and stuff. That's all done in in your browser in JavaScript as well. Um, but right now we are looking at a map of the Earth. Um, I tend to go to Alaska these days, but so this is I showed this yesterday. But if we just go here and we just pick four points here and we hit plot, that is now you can see the progress bar at the top. That is now going in to an X-ray data set, a data cube, and it is pulling out the at for those four points. It's pulling out every every uh, every image pair that had a velocity in that data cube. It's probably well, actually, I know that in the lower part of that glacier, it's about eighteen thousand velocity pairs. In the upper part, it's forty. Um, the the point of all of this, the reason we're using this JavaScript version instead of the one that's linked off of the, the page is that we didn't crash a server at MSIDC. The, the JavaScript is running on a development that, or sorry, there is another way to get to a browser like this. Um, you can go to the its live web page, which does have the dash in it. And down here, you can get into Jupyter Notebooks. We do not have there will be a Jupyter Notebook here that shows you how to use the Python and Julia libraries that for its live, 
but they're they're not there right now um, because those libraries are brand new and under development. And the the browser that I just the URL you just put in there that's been around six days. So and it's not mine; it's his. Um, and so it is. I just haven't linked it here yet. It's definitely under development. But but I'm going to now do this, and I ask you not to. I'm going to launch the the browser at NSIDC because I just wanted to use it to make a point. It's functionality that's not currently in the other one. Um, the, you know, this almost comes up as slowly as a, a as other other virtual sort of things that. So the yesterday I made the point that that data in the cloud, the functionality you want is that everybody uses the same URL. Because that's true, somebody unrelated with our project could write a tool to browse our data. It allows the open source community innovation to happen. And that is an issue as we move data into the cloud, depending on how hard it is to get to, can that happen or not? So we're gonna go to the same place in the same, so you might really notice that the functionality here looks an awful lot like that JavaScript tool. Like you wouldn't even know that one was different than the other in terms of how it's working. Um, that this is th this slow loading here is is entirely because uh, that's my fault. It's it's the the bucket that that stuff is in. Um, but well, maybe not. Okay. You shouldn't have to add, add points as if you type in the. We'll do it anyway. There's one. We'll just plot one point here. Anyway, th 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 this notebook works really well. It's not, and it's just that it doesn't work if seven people are on it, right? That's, that's, I was just trying to avoid that issue. But where, where I'm going here is the, the, what you're looking at is, is the center, the, the time that these are being plotted at is the center time between two images, but those two images can be two years apart or a year apart. And so they're a long-term average instead of something that's shorter. Right now, the longest term, longest image pair is 120 days. If I go out here to 385 and the back end of it, I go to 300, you know, so that's 365. Now, all of a sudden, the data is really, really clean. That's actually direct measurement of one year's motion of the ice, the features move this far. And it's just that the data set's so dense that you can go in and get an actual direct measurement of a single year average. Because these are highly, when you look at really short time scales, this is actually science, which is kind of cool. So when you look at really short time scales, there's a lot of high frequency variation and there's structure and it's not a clean sign. You so how do you do an annual average of that? Is a difficult problem because of the sampling, but you can cheat and, and take a shortcut. And I really, so in this browser or in the other browser, what I am trying to encourage you to do um, is, is just use this for your favorite glacier for five minutes. We could go to Flatty Is Point. Maybe we should, I've never been there. Well, it's not moving fast enough. Let's go to Zachariah. So use this for your favorite glacier and look at what is in the time series and make a decision about whether or not it's worth the time to figure out how to use this data. So before data access, check out the data set. But because the data is in the cloud and it's the entire data set and it can be accessed this way, you, you have the ability that you, we are all looking at the data of record. And that is sort of what the cloud, the promise the cloud really holds is that all of us work from the original file and we're not, all creating our own versions of the data every time I want to do an analysis. And I'll get off my high horse because I got to go catch a plane and I apologize. Um, but it, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't, I agree, but it's not worth it, worth it. You, you can, you can pip install its live if you want to. And I, I, I think- like It'll take 10 seconds to answer it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so those time series, yes. uh, before you, you know, kind of said just for a year yeah. average. So is that, um, are those like baselines for like annual averages and 
No, that's um, that's absolutely every that that is every single chip correlation where you saw between two images you saw a motion. Yeah. It's it's the it's the displacement divided by the time. So the annual averages aren't plotted initially. That's those aren't annual averages. Those are chip displacements over a year. It's it's the actual displacement, the distance, the surface. So it's a single point measurement of the displacement over a year. And so you're really in the raw data, right? You're not doing statistics on the data and the data is messy, but you can look at the data set this way. If you go to your 300 meter a year glacier, you're gonna be really disappointed. It's gonna look noisy and I apologize, but that's because we haven't done anything to get rid of things. Anyway, I, I'm gonna take off. Uh, this, is, this is iceberg scrubbing every spring. That is that last thing. But there is a pulse that moves upstream from the data scale on, on the left side. That's two kilometers a year and four kilometers a year. The, the, so that's the content of the data set. But really, the, the main point here is go in and look, look in Antarctica, look anywhere you want to click and see if there's something there that might be useful to you. And then spend the time to, to figure out whether or not you want to use it. Okay. Cool. All right. Sorry. It's like Thank working. you. All right. So next is going to be Sophie Gulliber talking about G Hub. Uh, can you share your screen with us? Okay. Are you seeing my screen? Yeah. Cool. Good to okay. So I'm I'm not going to do like a a, a real tutorial. Like, oh. am I still there? Yeah. You're okay. There. Zoom. Zoom just told me that it quit, um, but it clearly didn't. Um, yeah, so I'm going to just go through a little bit of the GHub functionality again. I'll skip through things we went through yesterday. I just wasn't sure if there were going to be new people here today. And then I'll actually walk through the website a little bit just so you sort of have that step zero familiarity. Um, so yeah, GHub is a, a science gateway where we can share tools and um, data sets with educators and data scientists and researchers and anything in between. Um, and Hub Zero is our infrastructure. So the website is actually built on this um, Hub Zero open source software that was developed at the University of California, San Diego. And it was specifically designed to help a community share resources and work together um, through creating data sets or interactive simulations using things like Jupyter Notebooks, other things we've seen today, um, and help you sort of publish things, um, data sets, tools, and white papers. Um, and um, provide space for research teams to collaborate. Um, so a lot of similar things that we've talked about today. Uh, G Hub resources, I sort of break them down into you know, tools and data sets, and then we are building up our educational capacity and then sort of other resources like publications and presentations that you can upload as well. So if you have like course material or a talk or a lecture that you wanna share widely, that can be housed on G Hub and opened and shared. Um, with uh, sort of citable information as well. So tools I talked about yesterday a little bit, these are those notebooks or user interfaces that are um, put onto your working scientific code. <laughs> data sets, as I mentioned, um, can be, uh, GHUB can be used as a repository for this data. And are you, are you moving slides or are you still on the same first slide? Sorry. Sophie, I accidentally muted you in trying to unmute myself to, to oh. <laughs> your slides were in advancing and then Tasha Tasha had the same idea. Oh where so sorry, where where did I get muted? You didn't get muted um in anything that you were like really saying. I was just making sure you hadn't tried to advance your slides because we had been on the same slide the whole time you were talking. Oh, I am on the data set. Okay, um, now now you now it's there for us. Okay. Yeah. You Maybe. just started oh, talking about that slide. Okay. <laughs> Tech problems everywhere. Um okay, it says it's loading and do you guys see it? Yeah, we're good. Yeah, my computer I guess everyone's computers are on Friday mode. <laughs> uh, okay. Sorry, <laughs> my Zoom just crashed again. I don't know what's going on. Maybe my computer has COVID too. Okay, let me try this one more time.
Okay, I didn't get a crash report this time. Um, yeah, data sets, uh, I said all this yesterday. Okay, did the slides advance? Yep. Okay, <laughs> um, and so as I mentioned yesterday, we also link just on our webpage to other relevant data sets for um, ice sheet scientists. And uh, it's not shown here, but we also include like a page on useful paleoclimate data. I know it's not necessarily like what the FOGS group is looking for, but we're also trying to interact with paleoclimatologists as well. So we currently don't, you know, actually interface with these like the way you would in your your the cloud tutorials, but we're um, having active conversations with, you know, Tasha and everyone else um, to figure out how G-Hub and CryoCloud can sort of work together. We don't know what that looks like yet, but that is something that we are working towards just so everyone knows. Um, G-Hub is a great place to sort of store educational materials because these educational modules that maybe you build in, in um, Jupiter can be actually housed and launched directly in G-Hub for you know, school age students up to university level students um, for classwork or, or for outreach. Um, and it's a really good place to even like learn to code in R, Python, or Octave without actually needing to install anything because you can just upload it and um, or you can just open up any instance of Jupyter and start working right away. And right now we have a great notebook on how to use R with a lot of examples and we're working on building like a Python version and then also um, you know, introdu in introducing geospatial packages as well. Uh, we have a lot of other other resources. They're not necessarily used right now because GHub is still so new. But like I mentioned before um, here, you know, you can share lectures or presentations that you um, want to house somewhere, publications, workshops, um, or, you know, miscellaneous, which um, could be anything. We also have a lot of other capabilities that we um, that I presented yesterday, so I'll quickly go through those. As I mentioned, you know, you can open Jupyter Notebook or Lab on the Hub. Um, <laughs> and you can also run your own Debian 10 Linux workspace, which I don't have pictured here. Um, GHUB gives you access to high performance computing um, at the Buffalo Center for Computational Research. And to do that, actually within your codes, we have this thing called the submit functionality, which um, is a command that actually runs uh, in either your workspace command line or within the Jupyter terminal where you're sort of submitting that code to run on our, um, our clusters at uh, CCR. Um, we also have uh, Globus utilities to transfer uh, GHUB data sets in and out of CCR storage. So if you have data that you want to transfer, we have Globus uh, available to you. Uh, GHUB groups, as I mentioned yesterday, are features that you can use for collaboration. Um, you sort of can create your own wiki page um, and you don't even need to, you can just log on to GHUB and use this, you don't actually need to do any coding at all to access any of these. You can use them for your group if, if that's the functionality that, that, that you're interested in. Um, projects um, are a place to um, provide updates, to-do lists, and um, notes on specific projects uh, and provide um, file management. And as I mentioned yesterday, each project comes with a Git repository that's hosted on GHUB, um, so you can share files that way as well. Um, so now I'm actually just going to pull up um, the uh, G-Hub uh, site and just sort of walk through it um, just so it gives you a sort of introduction to what the website looks like and where to go to for certain things and sort of just like a step zero. Um, and it, it's the ghub.org. If you search G-Hub, I think something else pops up, which I think is the same thing for CrowdCloud. I think people keep feeding us to our names. Uh, but search the G-Hub and it'll pop up. And this is the opening page. <laughs> and uh, if you scroll down, this is sort of our introduction page where you can reach things um, here. And we have um, new and resources that get popped up here. We're constantly changing how our website looks. Let me zoom in a bit. Um, uh, to make things more you know, easy to use. And so when you first come to GHUB, the first thing you'll want to do is actually go and create an account. And so it'll look like this for you when you come here and you would just go to create an account. Um, pretty standard stuff, make your username, your password, contact information. Um, 
If you have an institutional email, I recommend using that so you can get approved much quicker. Um, but if not, and you notice that you haven't gotten approved in a day, just send us a, a message at support um, at the ghub.org and they can help you out. Um, and then personal information is here. You can upload your website and your ORCID ID as well. And if you'd like to receive email updates from Web Zero and our classic human trip. Um, so you'll make that. And then I'm just gonna go log into my own account. And then once you have your own account, you'll be taken to your dashboard. And so this is something that everybody has. Um, and you'll, uh, your, your dashboard will be empty when you start but you can add your own modules, um, you know, as you start to use GHub and things become more useful to you, you know, you can add things that track tickets that you share, questions, wishes, messages, whatever. Um, right now I have the My Tools module, which shows like the tools that I frequently use, the sessions, the things that I currently have open and contributions that I'm making. And we'll go over this a little bit more later. So these are actually tools that I'm currently working on. <laughs> Um, okay, and so I'm going to zip on over to the tools page, and so this is sort of the main functionality of GHUB right now, which is uh, these tools that you can actually explore and use and then contribute on your own. And so uh, our first set of tools that we have listed here are HPC based tools, and these are tools that use high performance computing resources to actually access data sets and perform parallel computations. And so all interaction with that is handled by the tool and then users are actually using a, a friendly user interface. And so to open these, you click on one of them and every tool has the same um, interface here. It's going to have who created it, title, um, information on uh, if there's questions that have been asked. So if you're using a tool and you have a question um, for the authors of that tool, you can ask that here. Um, if there's any reviews of the tool, so if you use it and you want to leave a review, you can do that. And then um, detailed usage. So if you create a tool that you're sharing, you want to know who's using it and when that information is available to you. All tools have an information page. So this is like the about with the abstract, any references you want to include, and then um, how you would potentially cite that tool um, if you use that for um, some research. And all of that information, like I shared before, is here. Um, questions. There's no questions on this tool yet. Citations. Um, if there's any um, versions, so different versions of the tool will be listed here as well. <laughs> a wish list. So if you have a tool that you use um, and you're like, man, I really wish that this would, you know, uh, export a CSV file for me, you can add that here and then the developers of the tool will see that and can potentially add that for you. And then if there's any supporting documentation, such as the paper that's linked to this tool, you can add that in the supporting documents. Um, and so I'm uh, actually already opened this just to save some time. So if you hit launch tool, the thing that pops up is this page. And so this is a Jupyter notebook that's running in um, app mode. And so that's something that the developers define ahead of time. And so um, once you hit launch, this is what sort of pops up. And you'll see all this information about the tool, which I'm not going to get into because we're not actually focusing on that. But these developers actually created a really nice user interface that allows for crevasse detection using ATM data that's stored on the hub. And so you fill all this in, um, and then you actually would hit run the workflow. And now it's running this workflow on our computing cluster and will, um, <laughs> excuse me, uh, send you an email or a message, depending on what the tool um, says earlier, um, when that job is done and your information is sort of um, set. So if you have something that you'd like to share like this, um, this is sort of one way um, to go about that. If you want to actually look at like what's behind the front facing really pretty user interface, you hit the edit app. This is probably very small. You can actually see all the code that goes into developing um, the user interface and the uh, actually back end of the code, which again, I'm not gonna go into, but this is available to people to look at. Um, and then app mode reopens that. And then when you're done with a, a tool, um, so let's say you're here, you're done de detecting your crevasses, um, you're just gonna hit terminate session so that you can open up other ones and it'll take you back to your dashboard. A more simple um, tool, which may be more accessible than you know something 
creating something that's like entirely user friendly user interface is um, we also have um, just Jupyter notebooks that provide code and, and show examples. So the approximized by localized, <laughs> excuse me, penalized splines or the Alps tool is just like this. It has all that same information as that last tool, but when you launch it, which I already have again to save time, it just opens up as a regular Jupyter notebook. And so you can come through and actually interact with all of the um, uh, code here. Um, this user or this developer uh, wants you to select kernel, restart and run all. So that just runs all the cells. And so it plots everything really nicely. So you can scroll through and see what's happening. <laughs> Let that run. Um, and so you can come in here and if you want, you can, the developer said, hey, you can hide all these code cells and actually just look at um, examples of this code and say, hey, this is something I wanna do. I'm gonna go and download this, this tool. Um, or you can actually see what's sort of happening here. Um, and so they, they show different examples of how to use this Alps model um, and all the data that they use is actually stored within the tool. Um, they also give you the op option to sort of show um, all the um, functions that are actually built within, Alp, uh, within Alps. So this is an example of a tool that was developed um, to go alongside of a paper that uh, Prashant wrote on the Alps. So you can actually go in and see how he's making all of these figures and it's all housed on GHub. So you don't have to go and download all of his code to recreate all of his figures and see everything he's done. It's all housed on GHub. So you can just come in and, and um, play with it here. Um, you can mess around with the code within the notebooks tools and it won't save it. So you can do whatever you want. Um, and then as soon as you exit and you terminate the session, um, it gets and that uh, next time you open that tool, none of that that is saved. Um, and then that goes back there. Okay, and then if we go back to our tools, all the way back at the bottom, we have our um, Jupyter Notebook and Workspace instances. So this is um, tools that are providing you a platform to open up Jupyter Notebooks, and um, you can use these to create new GHub tools as well. So we go here. This is our Jupyter on Deb 10. It's um, uh, a Jupyter notebook that's um, opening in a Debian 10 environment. And everything uh, is very similar to like what we saw in CryoCloud. Um, we also have Jupyter Lab, but I'm just gonna show the Jupyter notebook interface because um, I have that open. Um, but once you launch this tool, you're opening um, an instance of Jupyter notebook on your own computer with your own um, interface here. If you want to upload anything, you just click upload and upload that from your own computer in a similar way to what we saw in CryoCloud. You also have access to the terminal here, except it opens in a new window instead of a nice um, extra tab like it does in Jupyter Lab. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, okay, and so before I go any further here, I'm going to go back and show you. Um, so how to actually contribute a tool. So if you're on the GHub page and um, let's say you have a Jupyter notebook that you'd like to share, or you'd like to develop something within GHub to share, um, maybe something that's attached to a paper or a really cool new package that you have and you wanna display it um, and have it housed on GHub, this is the process. Um, if you go to how to contribute tools, it'll show a very simple explanation of all of of everything um, that I'll go over. And we have a lot of information on all of the in intricacies of like sharing tools. Um, I will say that right now, it's a little bit all over the place in our support files. Um, so if you have specific questions, sometimes it can be hard to find exactly what you need. So I'm in the process of developing tutorials and examples of how to share your um, scripts and your workflows a little bit easier. Um, so that's in the process. So as if, if this is something you're interested in, um, there'll be a survey at the end that you can sign up for our email list and it'll have a little bit more, um, you know, coherent um, flow of how to actually share your tools and to access things in GHub and sort of video form, very similar to what um, like Twilist developed for Hugh Greenland. Um, 
So when you want to develop or add a tool that you've created, you want to share a notebook, you're going to go to add a tool, and it's going to take you to this page um, where you actually register it. So the first process is actually registering this tool. You're going to give it a term, uh, a name. I'm just going to call it Bog's test tool. Um, and so this is um, the short name for the directory containing the tool. Um, I'm just going to call it test tool because I'm not actually going to save this. Um, we're going to keep it version one. The at a glance is sort of the um, simple description of uh, what the tool does. Um, and you can expand on this later, but I'm, I'm just going to keep that there for now. The repository host. So this is where the actual code that your tool is being developed in is going to be hosted. We can host a subversion repository on GHub or a Git repository on GHub, um, but you can also host um, all, you can pull your data that you your code that you have from GitHub, and we can host it on on um, GHub. And uh, GHub requires a certain file structure to share your um, notebooks. It's it's very simple, um, and we're developing actually templates in GitHub. If you want to use GitHub as your primary storage, um, uh, so if you do check this, you um, paste your repository for your source code here, and someone will get in contact you, with you about that. Um, but right now, we'll just say we're going to host the code repository on the hub, and we're going to be sharing a Jupyter notebook. And so right now, um, access is set to anyone can run the tool when it's published. The source code access is open, and the project area access is open. You can change all of this um, depending on what you need. Um, and we have, you know, this, what should I choose? Uh, we prefer that anyone can run it and that it's open source, um, but you can change this as you're uh, developing. So you may want to start with it being closed at first. So it's restricted to development team until you install it. Um, but we'd like everything to be open source. You can also set your development team here. Um, and this is just the GHub logins for people who are working on it. So then we hit register tool. Oh, someone, someone already did this. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so after it's registered, now GHub knows that um, you want to do this, you want to upload your tool. Um, so it's giving you this page. And this is your um, status page for the tool. So this has the information that you just included, um, gives you sort of what your next steps are, which we'll walk through that in a second. But this is sort of where you're going to be undertaking installing and, and pulling that um, repository. So these developer tools are useful to you um, as you're installing these tools. Um, so message here is actually um, how you would ask questions about what's going on with your tool to our site administrator. Um, the timeline. Uh, we'll take you to the HubForge. So HubForge is um, actually where we are um, uh, storing this timeline. HubForge is where your wiki for your tool is stored, which let me go back to that. Here. So every tool gets a wiki that's formed in the hub forage. And so this is for people who are developing on that tool, um, developing source code and documentation. Um, and usually what you'll use this for is you're going to the, the getting started um, symptom, uh, sorry, the getting started page. And then it'll give you some information on how to actually pull this repository and start working in it. Um, so we'll start here with the what's next. So the GHub team has created you your project area. And so that's this. Um, uh, it's actually the hub forge. We used to be called BHub when, when we had some technology hub. So this is a typo that we will change, but it's the GHub forge, it should be. And that's where you find this. And so to um, follow, you can follow these steps to get um, to your project area. So what you're actually going to do to start working and actually add your notebook uh, that you want to share, you're going to go to this wiki, you're going to go to get started, and then it's just going to show you how you would actually um, 
clone the repository that um, GHub has created for you that we want you to host your tool in. And so this can be done on your own local machine. You can do all of your tool building on your local machine and in, in uh, Crowd Cloud, whatever. It's um, a Git repository in the same way that any Git repository is. We also have Subversion if you use Subversion, but I didn't know what Subversion was until I started working on uh, GHub. So I assume most people use Git. And this is done in the same way where you're actually just cloning that repository. And I'll show how that works um, within my own Jupyter Home notebook. So I'm going to open up the terminal here. Paste that. And now it's going to close that, uh, clone that repository for me. If you aren't using the Jupyter instance to do any of this, you're using it on your own computer. When you clone the repository, it'll probably ask you to log in. And that's just your regular GHub login information. So now this repository has been formed in my home directory and I can open that up. And it's already set up all of the directories that I need for um, developing this. Um, tool. And so when I actually want to create the um, notebook, I can either work on development here, or I can upload the notebook that I want to share. I don't have an example here. Um, I can actually upload the notebook to this instance here. Um, and then that's where it'll pull from. The most important thing that I'll just talk about right now is this middleware file and this invoke script. This invoke script is what GHub uses to actually start your tool. And it uses this command here, start Jupyter tool. And it's looking for a notebook because I told it to look for a notebook when I um, registered my tool. So it's looking for a notebook that's called fogs test tool .i -i notebook. Uh, and that's what you're going to want to name your notebook or rename it here if you're calling it something else. So I would go here and I would create my notebook. And I would call it Fog's test tool. And then I would, you know, develop my code here. Uh, and then after, let's say I'm all finished, I'm all done with that. Um, I have my tool and I want to uh, actually install it so I can start testing it so other GHub users can use it. Um, you would use the same um, functionality as uploading things to like GitHub, you're gonna go back to your um, terminal and actually um, use git push to push that repository back onto GHub. And so now GHub is going to have the um, updated code and you're gonna click my code is committed, working and ready to be installed, um, which we don't have for this tool because I just made it up. Um, so I'm going to show you one that I actually have um, installed. Um, so this, here we go. This is what it'll look like. This is a, a separate tool that an undergrad is working on. Um, it's a very much in development, but I installed it just so you can see what that's going to look like. Um, so I will uh, go to Wiki. It has all the same information um, here if you wanted to clone it. So this is where I would clone that repository. And I actually have it in my um, uh, Jupyter anyways. So ice sheet profile. So this is what this repository looks like for this tool. And we have our um, ice sheet profile here, um, our notebook. So I know this looks good. And I've already pushed it back into GHub. And so, um, oh, go back. And so once the um, Hub Zero side of things have installed it, you're going to hit launch tool. Um, if you're on Google Chrome right now, you're going to get an arrow that says the requested content cannot be loaded. Please try again later. That is not true. It's um, loading. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it works fine on like Mozilla or Safari. I don't know why it's happening on Google Chrome only, but you will get that arrow, but just wait and it'll pop open. And so now this is what the notebook would look like if you launched it. Um, and so she just has, you know, very simple um, notebook interface right now with a plotting. She's working on this, but this is um, how you would um, say, okay, this all works. Let me run all this. Everything's working. Um, my data plots, cool. And we'll say, um, let's pretend that that's, um, you know, 
done, um, I can say my tool is working properly and I approve it. Um, and then we'll um, advertise it on the resources page. Or let's say you um, need to undertake more development, you see something's wrong, you can go back and uh, work on it, push that new code back up to the repository and then say, I've committed new code, please install it and then go through that process again. Um, and so this is uh, like the basic interface. It can become much more complex depending on what you're doing. Um, if you're having issues with this, that's when you use this message function. And that's when um, the people on the Hub Zero side who are actually working on like the tool launching and the tool installation side will help you. Um, <laughs> um, any tools that you are currently working on are um, always going to be stored in your My Contributions. And so this is a module that you can install on your dashboard. So these are all the tools that I'm working on. Um, you can see if they've just been created and I'm actually working on them or if they're installed and ready to be um, tested. Um, that's all going to be housed in your contributions page. Um, Okay, so that's um, all I'm going to share today because it is 1240. Um, it was a very quick overview. I just wanted to really show uh, what the pages looked like so you knew where you were, what buttons to press. Um, I don't expect anyone to be able to um, right now go into GHUB and deploy something. Um, I'm, I'm working on a, a more in-depth sort of step-by-step -step tutorial, but I wanted to show you what that would look like to get from, I have a Jupyter notebook that I want to share with everyone to, um, I want to be able to join this page of people and, and uh, open up this notebook, hit launch, and people can view my code. Um, I will say we're also working on um, figuring out if it's possible to get DOIs for tools. So if you're producing a paper that has a workflow that you want to share, um, and make it uh, usable by others. Um, you know, they can upload their own data and, and output something in a similar way to the crevasse tool. Um, and you want that citable, we're working on that. Um, uh, but right now we also <coughs> are still growing. Um, G-Hub is um, very much at its beginning stages. So we want to be a community. Um, and so we also need, um, buy-in from communities. You're the developer of these tools that we want to share. And so we need to get your buy-in and we need to get your tools up here if that's something that you want to do uh, and then get people using them. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, we're powered by the Hub Zero platform. So a lot of what we're um, doing here is, is run through them. I'm more of like a project manager. So um, I'm here to help and guide people in the right direction. Um, but we have a large team behind GHUB that's actually um, helping us actually get your tools up. If, if you're interested in using HPC based tools, and you don't know how to start, um, you can come to us and um, we'll help you out with that. Um, yeah, I apologize if I've been ranting. Um, oh, I'm you're great. Pretty uh, brain foggy. So <laughs> Jessica has a question. Yeah, Jessica. Yeah, thanks, Sophie. Uh, that was really great. It was exciting to learn um, some more. So you said one of the ways that you can bring in a tool is through an existing GitHub repository. Um, and I'm wondering what happens. Are you creating a fork or a copy of that repo in the GitHub org or in the GHub organization so that, like, I guess I'm thinking about how the tracking works, right? Like, can I still make changes to my initial repository and then just tell GHub that it needs to update to the newest version? Or do I have to like now maintain both of those repositories? No, um, it will do what you said. If you're updating within your GitHub and you say, oh, I've made changes, I need to push it, then that's exactly how it'll happen. You don't have to maintain two repositories. Um, I haven't done that yet, so I can't um, say, I, I don't know the exact um, um, workflow for that. We don't have like a button yet that's like, um, uh, we have like the, I've installed a new code on your Git. Um, it's a little bit different for the GitHub, but that is, uh, we don't want you to have to maintain two repositories. That's what we're doing on the on the GHub side. It's, it's taking that code that's in your GitHub and then pushing it to GHub for it to be used so you can continue using um, uh, the, um, your GitHub. The only difference is that 
Um, we just need that middleware invoke script in order for it to run on GHub. So usually it's just a matter of you adding that folder to your GitHub repo for us to pull it and then upload it um, to GHub. Cool, totally makes sense, thanks. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions? Um, I am gonna share my screen again really quick. Uh, I had a quick question while you're doing that. Mm -hmm. um, you had said that you guys are purchasing DOIs. We are we are working on it. It's uh, apparently very expensive for Hub Zero to mint DOIs, and so we're working mm -hmm. on maybe Zenodo. But um, we were hoping that uh, that would be a functionality. But that's still a big okay. conversation that we're having. If that's what people want for their tools, then that's what we're thinking about. I I was yeah. My question was going to be why not just use Zenodo. Yeah, that's, that is a big, um, that's a question we have. We are, we were thinking like, oh, if we can mint the DOIs ourselves on Jihad, that sort of takes away that step of someone having to need to go and re-register it on Zenodo. Um, but I know that's, I think what you guys are doing, right? Um, uh, I didn't actually know that Zenodo had the communities, which I thought was cool. Like Cloud has their own Zenodo community. So I that mean, might yeah. be an option to look at. We aren't store, storing data or things yeah. like that. It's mostly encouraging people if they have specific kinds of content that are separate than the tools, then they can yeah. put those in there. But yeah, well, um, yeah, there is an integration with GitHub that uh, as well. That so if you like do certain actions, like tagging a new version or release or something, it will automatically create a new Zenodo DOI. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um. So this um, QR code is the same one that I shared yesterday and it links to this, um, this is the URL on the bottom. This is just a Google form that you can fill out um, and put your email in if you wanna stay up to date on things with GHUM. And it also has like one question on like, how do you best learn? And that's really helpful for me to understand how to, you know, build tutorials and like, what are people most excited for at GHUM and other questions that you have because, we're still growing and we want to be useful to people. We don't want to just put stuff out that people aren't going to use or want. So um, any feedback that people have that they're excited about or that, that they're unclear about or something that they really want to use, but they don't know where to start, um, use this form or send me an email. Um, my job right now is really just getting people up on G-Hub and, and helping them as best as I can to grow the platform. So I'm really here to collaborate with people. Um, and as I said earlier, we're, uh, it, it, it's been really great to have Tasha organize this because we're really excited about all of the tools that are out in the cryosphere and how we can all um, interact with each other. And you know, we don't know what that looks like just yet, but um, we're working towards that and it, it's really exciting. So um, just a big thank you to Tasha for, for getting this all together today. Yeah, and thank you, Sophie. This is awesome. Uh, G Hub is going to be super useful for all of us building tools and storing data and things. All right, so uh, I guess we're going to close there. Um, I will probably send out a survey as well. You're welcome to give feedback on the tutorial. Um, all of this stuff is still in development. CrowdCloud is a place where we can all like interact and give feedback and ask questions on any of the tools as they develop even further. Um, but yeah, definitely reach out if you have any questions um, and we should be able to help you between us and the developers like um, Sophie and um, Jessica and people who are, are developing in the cloud. Michaela can help and uh, all of the Grimp team and its live team. So yeah, go ahead and reach out. Thank you so much.